Members of committee, item 7.1 uh, was deferred from the November 7th committee meeting in order to allow Chris Murray to provide a presentation to the committee. Mr. Murray, welcome. The floor is yours anytime you need it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of committee. All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So the report that uh, is in front of you, uh, CM12017, uh, focuses on two key aspects of our organization. Uh, in Appendix A, we have the corporate-based departmental business plans, and in Appendix B, we have the strategic plan progress, uh, progress update. Uh, I'm going to just briefly talk about both and, uh, and obviously uh, be here to answer any questions that you have. Uh, in terms of strategic plan, as you well know, uh, this was approved April of 2012. Uh, our focus is essentially threefold. Uh, one, a prosperous and healthy community. Uh, for the reasons that we've stated before, we have many people that uh, uh, struggle with uh, household income and uh, it's incumbent upon us to do the very best job we can uh, to try and ease the burden on, on the uh, residential taxpayer. Uh, as well as we have neighborhoods that uh, we are focused on through the Healthy Neighborhood Program uh, that, that we're making some headway. So that's, that's our first area of focus. Uh, the second is the Valued and Sustainable Services, which you've received information on our service delivery program and we'll be coming back with some updates in the not too distant future. And third, uh, our focus is on leadership and governance certainly as it relates to uh, upper levels of government as well as uh, how we manage this workforce of ours. Uh, supporting those three strategic priority areas are 13 objectives and those are further supported by 64 strategic actions. I just want to let you know as of today, um, six of those actions are completed, 53 are in progress and five are not started yet but will be started next year. You'll recall that when we established all of these actions, we met with each one of you, and uh, it was our goal to list actions that we could start and complete this term of council. So at the end, you will be able to, when you go back to the electorate, demonstrate very clearly what kind of progress we have been making. And so with that, I'm happy to say that uh, I believe that we will be able to finish all actions within this term of council that we had committed ourselves to. In terms of the business plans, you recall uh, in our strategic plan, we very specifically under uh, item 21-8, uh, uh, we had said that we were going to uh, this year uh, have business plans for all the departments of this organization. And uh, we've been able to successfully do that. And the report in front of you speaks to uh, what is happening in each department in terms of the business planning work. Um, first of all, I want to point out this is the first year that all the departments since amalgamation have had business plans uh, readied. Uh, each department business plan is structured to support the specific actions, objectives that were identified under each of the strategic plan priorities, uh, highlights key initiatives that support the strategic plan so it specifies what work is being done, who's responsible for it, and when that work will be completed indicates departmental leads and partners as well as uh, the status of, uh, of that work uh, in terms of um, uh, it being uh, who's completing it and when will it get finished. Um, what you don't have in the business plans though are uh, all the work that uh, these departments undertake um, and I want to just uh, I guess give some recognition to both uh, uh, Tim McCabe and Elizabeth Richardson who as you know uh, for the last few years have had business plans. We have used uh, basically their work as a template for all other departmental business plans that you're seeing today. Um, this is a work in progress. I think it's important that we're all at a position now where we we do have plans that you can review to see where the work is, what work is being done, who's doing it. Uh, I do expect that next year the plans will get even more involved uh, in terms of dealing with uh, some of the legislative requirements that we're obligated to, uh, to do as well. The goal here is over time for our business plans to uh, 
uh, give you a much clearer connection between the work we're doing and how it relates to our budget. But in a way of relationship, uh, and again, this is in your report, um, the vision, which of course is your commitment to the citizens that elect you, um, that vision is translated into a strategic plan uh, of which that strategic plan is subsequently supported by the departmental business plans, which are further supported by the operating uh, plans and work plans of our uh, individuals in our organization. And all of this uh, gets translated into the annual budget. So um, this is really, at the end of the day, uh, important for us to be extremely transparent in the work that we're doing. I know from time to time some of you have concerns about where is our focus uh, in the organization, what work are we undertaking, how does it align with the direction that uh, you want us to move in, and I would argue that the fact that we now all have business plans is, is uh, uh, addressing that concern that you have, and you can see uh, where exactly it is that we're spending our time and, uh, and supporting the good work that our staff is doing. So in terms of recommendations, uh, we recommend that the 2013 departmental business plans attached to Appendix A uh, be referred to the respective standing committees for approval. It wasn't my intent to get into the plans here today in any great detail. We feel that they should be presented uh, in their detail at the respective standing committees. And with that, I just want to suggest that um, Tim McCabe, as you know, reports to two standing committees, uh, GIS and Planning Economic Development, and uh, we're going to suggest that Tim make his presentation to GI, GIC um, so that he's not doing it twice and to uh, avoid any confusion that might be generated. Uh, so with that, I'm here and happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Murray. We have uh, Councillor Clark and McCaddy. Uh, Councillor Clark is first. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, your report is excellent, and I think doing the business plans and the standing committees make a great deal of sense. Those committees have um, a real working knowledge the, in terms of, of the overall programs within their own standing committees. And I think overall, well, I know I'm very pleased overall when you look at the overall city and where we've been from talking about a vision and, and now to the point where we're, we have the strategic plan and now we're actually developing the action plan, the, the whole macro picture, and then you can see it, it's all coming together very nicely. The only thing that, that, that has popped up a couple of times in my mind, and, and um, if you feel that I'm not on track today in terms of point, Mr. Chairman, just advise me and, and I'll just bring it up at, at another meeting. Um, a lot of the documents talk about assets, a lot of the documents talk about capital. Um, in my mind, when I hear assets and capital, I think debt. Um, and I don't see anything, and I have not been able to find anything in our background documents anywhere about a debt policy. So does the senior management team have a debt policy that they're operating from, or is it something that council would have to do if we don't have that? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we don't, but one of the things in our work plan is to work on a financial sustainability plan, and one of the key features of a, of a financial sustainability plan that uh, Mike Zagarek and Joe Spiler will be working on is a debt policy, so we intend to bring one forward. And um, do we have a rough idea of how quickly that can come together? I, I'm just watching all the things around us, and, and when you look at the overall macro picture, it would be nice to have a very clear, concise, understandable debt policy approved and in place so future councils know where we were going and it's easier for them to follow the track. Uh, three, Mr. Chair, so the debt policy will likely come, I would say, would probably sometime after the second quarter of uh, 2013 after the budget is done and all the work that we're doing on the SDR service delivery review it's basically the same people that are working on it so I would say I would think sometime after June uh, that that would that policy would likely come to the table I would have to sit down though with Mike and uh, and Joe just to give you exactly uh, when uh, it would be for you. Um, and Mr. Deputy Mayor um, sorry 
Oh, Chris, Chris sorry. So if I can, I, I did have a chance to talk to Mike about that very issue. And as you're you're raising an incredibly important point, I think is it's fundamental to our financial sustainability plan, which is one of the items that we have not initiated and will be initiating next year. So I think timing wise, Rob is right. It should be by the end of the second quarter uh, presented to you so that uh, you can. Uh, you know, uh, establish your uh, level of comfort in terms of uh, just how much debt this organization goes into. So, oh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, just to be clear, because I, I don't want to lose anything over time, <laughs> um, has the council passed a motion? I know we did financial sustainability motion specifically to Capital Works. We did it, Council Powers and I, and Collins on the old Audit and Administration Committee. I don't recall any direction towards our staff to develop a new debt policy. So do we need to formalize that with direction? Yep. Uh, three, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, so the debt, um, I mean, we're, we're taking it as part of a financial sustainability plan. Is typically there's a number of fiscal policies or reserve policies or debt policies that municipalities uh, put in place. So we intend on bringing one forward to council as part of the work that's associated with the financial sustainability plan. If council wants to move a formal direction on, on a debt policy, that's fine, but the intention is that we're going to do it. It's part of the, um, it was included in the strap plan, it's included in our. Council Clark, would you like to bring that forward formally at the appropriate yeah, time? I think I would because I, I didn't see where the debt policy was in our strap plans. I know financial sustainability was. Right. But my preference would be to, to at the appropriate time. I'm more than willing to accept it now. Okay, I, I would just move that we direct our staff to develop a formal debt policy for the City of Hamilton. A second by. Whitehead. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Thank you. The report was excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, moving on, we have now Councillor McCaddy and then Powers. Councillor McCaddy. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thanks, Chris, for the presentation. Uh, I, I just um, had a question just because I can't recall sort of where we're at with the, uh, I guess it falls under leadership and governance, but uh, the whole perspective of uh, government relations. and. Uh, I know you were working on a report on that, uh, and we're, we're well into our term of council and, uh, you know, just uh, short of two years left uh, in this term of council. So just um, where we are, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, on, on that report and uh, uh, any thoughts you have on what we uh, might uh, be, the suggestions might be to do as a council in, in, the, uh, in the next uh, two years before we finish our mandate, uh, Mr. Chris? Deputy Mayor. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, the, the report, in fact, has been drafted. Mike Kirkopoulos has been working on it. He has a final draft. It's coming to the next uh, uh, Fairness and Hamilton Committee. Uh, the actual date of that, I believe, is in December. Uh, so we will be presenting it to the committee at that point in time, which the committee will then, I assume, refer the thing uh, forward to GIC for, for final acceptance. Um, it focuses on the, uh, the four main areas that uh, we had uh, committed to in the strategic plan, that being infrastructure, transportation, housing, and AODA. Um, so it does spell out uh, exactly um, uh, how it is that we should be conducting ourselves in terms of, uh, you know, uh, developing and executing an, uh, you know, an effective government relations strategy. So um, it's a matter of, I would say, a couple of weeks before you see it in, in its... Uh, and its fullness so and we'll obviously be taking direction from you at that point as to any amendments we need to make to it so we're in pretty good shape on that front thanks very much uh, Chris and just as a point of interest I'll, I'll mention that the uh, council will remember the LRT uh, task force that we uh, moved to motion to add three uh, city councillors to the Chamber of Commerce's LRT task force and uh, I was part of a phone call last week on uh, on the uh, government relations uh, subcommittee they've set up. They're, they're very early uh, in their efforts. Uh, so I uh, participated in that last week. And uh, the first, uh, well, the first one we're, we're going to be attending, the LRT task force occurs tomorrow. Uh, Councillor Farr and myself will be there. I think Councillor Fergus is still away, but is on that. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Councillor McKinney. Yeah. Oh, Excuse me, I can't hear a word that's being said. And the good councillor is saying some important things. Okay, um, so Ms. I thanks. Councillor Partridge. Um, now, uh, Pine or Councillor McCaddy. So back Could you repeat what you just said? Uh, yes, because I didn't yeah, hear just that. Uh, just, uh, uh, 
Okay, I'll just try and highlight uh, the, uh, the aspects of... Uh, under Councillor Clark's guidance, uh, no, just, uh, yeah. and everything else that follows uh, relates to that, uh, that uh, introduction. Uh, but the, uh, I was just saying that uh, under the topic of government relations, uh, Council will recall the LRT task force that uh, we decided to join the chamber because they, uh, they're well organized, they've got all the right players around the table. And I uh, uh, sat through, I participated in a telephone conversation last week on the government relations subcommittee of, of that task force. Uh, uh, and that was an interesting discussion early on uh, in the process, so no substantive uh, uh, items to uh, to really report on that, but the LRT task force with councillors uh, meets for the first time tomorrow. Councillor Farr and I will be there. I think Councillor Ferguson is still away, but is on that uh, task force as well, and we'll report back uh, on that uh, certainly. And uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I just had another question, uh, and maybe uh, for for, uh, for Carolyn in terms of the motion that was moved uh, some time back, and Mr. Mayor as well, and, and uh, Chris or others who may remember. Uh, Councillor Whitehead, I think, was involved in the, in the motion. But I, I have it in my memory that um, we actually, threw a motion, committed to having a, a special discussion around which items we're going to engage other levels of government in from a government relations perspective. Uh, uh, and we would have a, a, a council or a, probably a GIC meeting on that, uh, uh, led by the mayor uh, with, with his role in that capacity. And I wonder if... Uh, if anybody remembers that motion, uh, I don't have it in front of me. It just twigged with uh, with Chris's uh, comments in the presentation this morning, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Is that something that uh, we're, we're still going to do? Uh, just thinking that that's my memory of that motion. Uh, in any case, we would have a special discussion uh, led by the mayor, uh, Mayor Bettina, on uh, what our priorities are. And then, of course, we'd all engage in that. This is in addition to the uh, Fairness to Hamilton committee efforts. So uh, you're looking for a status on that particular yeah. issue? Uh, yeah. uh, Chris, do you recall um, if we married the two, perhaps? So it, could we marry the two issues together or is that a separate issue altogether? There is, um, I can say this, uh, the draft uh, government relations document that's coming forward recognizes that there may be issues that go beyond the four that I identified that are in our strap plan. And so in terms of there being a list I do recall, though, I think you're right, that there was there was conversation at one of the committees about establishing, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a list in addition to the one that you've approved through the strap plan. So um, certainly I, I think probably to start that conversation off, would we could start with the Fairness to Hamilton Committee as to, uh, you know, lay out maybe a bit of a framework for that discussion. Then when the, the matter of the GR report comes forward to GIC, maybe that's, would give everyone some time as to, you know, uh, assembling a, a list of those topics that we think we should be carrying forward to the federal and provincial government in addition to the four core ones which we're going to have strategies around. So um, certainly the, the first formal opportunity I think would be in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but it's a good reminder I think here today because it's going to, it will come from that committee that the rest will be asked to uh, to brainstorm what are the other items that are, are uh, important for us to address. Uh, this term of council. Thanks, Chris. And Mr. Deputy Mayor, I think it's important that we all engage in that conversation. And, and if we can uh, try and find that motion, I, I think it might have been a council motion as compared to GIC. Uh, but it, but I believe that you yeah. know, being a motion, we need to act on it. And I think it is outstanding. So I, I like your idea, Chris, to uh, to bring that motion into that discussion that flows out of the Fairness to Hamilton Committee. Uh, with the government relations report that you're, uh, you and Mike are working on, yeah. and then have that uh, conversation at a GIC, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, in, the, uh, in the, the days following the uh, Fairness to Hamilton Committee. I, I'll, I'll search for that uh, as well, and maybe if you don't mind, Carolyn, uh, searching for that motion so we can get the specifics of what was uh, moved by Council. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor McCann. Now, just for clarification purposes, we have Councillor Powers, Collins, Partridge, and Whitehead. Any further interested speakers? Hearing not, Councillor Powers. I'll be very quick uh, on the on the matter of government uh, relations. It's important that we, um, the your committee, uh, Councillor Marula, makes a decision on it. We're missing an action in both Ottawa and uh, and, and and Queens Park. We need a. A presence, some eyes and ears as to what's going on. Uh, you know, 
In my position at AMO, I can tell you there's a lot of things going on because of the proroguing of, of, of the legislature. And uh, um, so we need to have a presence in both those places, whether it's somebody representing us or, or whatever. So that that needs to be um, moved forward uh, with, with urgency, Mr. Um, Mr. Chair of the Fairness, to a Hamilton committee and then, and then back to us. The second issue is just the dovetailing of the service delivery review mm -hmm. and the strap plan and that. And I just, I guess I'm assuming that it's fine, but we need to ensure that the two of them are, uh, are working hand in step and one's not out of a line of the other one uh, as, as we evolve in, uh, in, in both these processes. So that's my question to Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray? Um, absolutely. I mean, as you know, the service delivery was the second pillar of our strat plan, and uh, obviously we needed to start by having a very clear understanding of the uh, services and subservices that we provide, so those profiles are done. Um, and then we are now working through a series of meetings with all of you in terms of uh, what are the opportunities uh, in light of those profiles that we should be exploring uh, with KPMG. Uh, to find greater efficiencies and savings. Uh, so we're working through that right now, and I hope that uh, we can bring that back to you, uh, if not in December, certainly by January. Um, it is a, it's a critical aspect to, uh, to our budget um, and uh, in our ability to kind of make sure that we provide services effectively and cost efficiently. So um, those two things are, you know, you know, it's like for me, you breathe in, you breathe out. I mean, those things are so uh, integrated. And as, our, as we pointed out here today, uh, our business plans, and I, I don't think we've you know, we're on the right road, I think, in terms of uh, being very transparent about what it is that we do, uh, what it costs us, what we achieve when we do it. Uh, so, um, you know, and the way that you run an administration, I think, is by being very conscious of where you need to get to, which is what our strat plan does for us. Uh, and how you get there is really what our service delivery uh, helps us understand is, you know, uh, what we work on every day and who's responsible for it and how do we compare to others. So uh, to me, these are just basic administrative tools um, that uh, have to, uh, you know, have to be uh, uh, clear uh, to the public so that they see what it is that uh, we spend their money on. So uh, I get your point. To your earlier point, though, Councillor, I think what you will you'll hear from Mike and I when we go to the Fairness to Hamilton Committee is you're absolutely right about... Um, a presence at the provincial and federal government um, and where they do business. Uh, we are extremely busy here in Hamilton trying to make sure that we run the administration as well as we can, um, but we lack uh, for a presence in those two places uh, where other municipalities smaller than ours, in fact, uh, invest wisely in resources uh, at Queen's Park and, uh, and, and uh, in Ottawa. So. Uh, we're going to be bringing that forward to the uh, subcommittee just to uh, raise it to everyone's attention, the importance of that service. Uh, I think it can be done cost effectively, and uh, so I, I absolutely understand what you're saying. Thank you, Councillor Powers. We now have Councillor Collins. Councillor Collins? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Chris, um, most of my questions regarding the government relations um, issue, they've been answered. I want to focus on uh, citizen engagement, and I know that's part of the plan, and I, I, I brought in a different agenda today. I, I didn't, didn't have my original one where I'd made some notes, but I, I think one area we're lacking certainly is the citizen engagement um, area, and, and I watched with great interest last night with uh, Councillor McCaddy and Farr and uh, Councillor Morelli's meeting here on the two-way streets issue and how many people attended, and there seemed to be some very positive um, discussions. It went beyond just a, you know, some kind of a bitch session where it was a long list of complaints of what the city didn't, doesn't do and should do. It was actually a very constructive dialogue as it relates to moving an, an important issue in this community forward. And, I, and I've always felt um, that the economic summit, I, I think, goes maybe halfway of where we need to get to. We, you know, um, I was just amazed at the, the one year we had maybe two or three hundred people in the room. Everyone was talking about Hamilton issues. And it was a very, there was a very constructive dialogue in terms of where we need to go on, on transportation issues, brownfield development, downtown, all those good things. Where it fell short, where it falls short, is that those people meet once a year. And, um, and I still think that there's still a disconnect between our council, uh, the chamber, and by extension, the, uh, the economic summit. And I, 
I've always felt that we should be leaders in that regard. You know, the fact that we're actually attending an event that certainly we support. Um, that, that, and, and those, all of their issues are city issues. I mean, we should be the ones that are hosting those events. We should be creating the agenda. And we should be the ones out there engaging the public, whether it's the business community, NGOs, um, the creative class, other stakeholders. And so I, along the lines of citizen engagement, we need something that's, you know, almost like a Your City series where um, I'm bringing a motion where I, uh, to the next planning committee. I think, you know, we've talked about this. I'd love to see a design charrette for Pier 8. We start talking about the architectural standards and we start involving, um, uh, continuing to involve the uh, neighborhood associations, the creative class. We should be bringing in architects from other parts of North America. And the same could, um, you know, we could do that same process for other areas. I know Councillor Morelli's talking about doing the same now for Barton Street. And, um, and certainly I think uh, the two-way streets issue that uh, Councillors McCaddy, Farr and, and Morelli are dealing with right now, you know, falls into that category. And so citizen engagement, especially with, with the expanded use of, of social media, and, uh, and there just seems to be a very positive vibe, especially with uh, the high vex people, everyone who's doing good things on James Street North. I mean, there, there are people who want to help the city, and I feel like at times that um, we're not uh, reaching out to them and inviting them into the tent to, to say and suggest you, need, you can be part of solving some of these problems. And so it, it needs to be more than just an ad in the newspaper. Uh, you know, we need to start renting buildings and rooms and, and, and dragging people out and actually bringing in some experts. And so I, I, I read, I was trying to read through here where we sit with the citizen engagement because I, I think that's where we're really lacking. And citizen engagement, I think, applies to almost the whole plan. You could pick anything off this list, whether it's dealing with our budgets or transportation issues or other, other things. And, and we've fallen short in that regard. So I, I'm hoping that um, I couldn't find it here you know, quickly this morning, but I'd, I'd like to know what the date is and, and what the plan is and whether there's an opportunity for councillors, individual councillors, to work with staff to come back with, as part of that strategy, as presenting that strategy to council committee. And, uh, and involving some of the same stakeholders that I just referenced. So I know that's a long question and I'm a comment, Murray. but. So uh, first of all, I think it's, um, I think it's spot on. The, uh, the person in our organization that's charged with the overall policy that's being developed and, and the uh, eventual execution of the policy is Paul Johnson. Um, by way of example, uh, I would say that the, the neighborhood, Healthy Neighborhood Program is an example of how you engage citizens in ways uh, that are uh, much more effective than just simply posting an ad in a paper and then having an information center. Um, so Paul is very familiar with uh, certainly what works, as does many people in this organization. So, But to your point, though, specifically in terms of the groups that you're talking about, to the areas where we're focused in on, through our strategic plan, how do we ensure that those plans reflect the uh, the views of our business community and, and citizens that live in these areas? I'm more than happy to come back and show you how we can engage people in a much more progressive way. We are certainly going out in terms of our broad array of services with, with some work in the first quarter of next year, which you've given us direction to do. Uh, where we will be uh, talking uh, very broadly with uh, the community about services that we, we provide and, and their feelings about those services and what they value. But in terms of these specific issues that you're raising, um, uh, I'm going to, I mean, you can provide me direction if you wish. Uh, I'm happy to go back and sit down with Paul to bring something back to you in the first quarter of next term. Uh, because, I mean, we don't need to be passengers on the bus. We drive the bus. Uh, you're the ones that make the decisions as to where we spend money and how we get things done quickly and, and do them well. Um, so uh, it's uh, music to my ears because uh, this is where we want to go. Um, and uh, you're absolutely right. I think the, you know, the, the vibe, I guess, if you want to call it that in this community is more on the optimism side. Um, and uh, we, quite frankly, um, you know, can work with uh, this community quite effectively in a bunch in a number of different ways. So, uh, I love what you're saying, and uh, happy to bring something back. Great, and, and as you say, there are people willing to help, and, and we we need to take them up on their offer. Yeah. So, oh, that's great. I'll certainly talk to both you and Paul oh. offline, and, and yeah. maybe we can come back with uh, something as part of an information report to committee and council that seeks to address the uh, citizen engagement aspect. Yes. Thank you. Is that it? Thank you, Councillor Collins. Now we're moving on to Councillor Partridge, Whitehead, and Clark. Councillor Partridge, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. 
Good morning. Good morning. And uh, I'll echo, echo the comments of previous speakers as well. Uh, excellent report. And it's, it's, it's great to see the bigger picture now filtering down into some specifics. There's just two quick points um, that haven't been touched on. One is, um, when, I, when I looked in your strategic objectives for 1.4, there was no mention of LRT. And Councillor McCaddy did touch on it, and we, and you know, I did, I did hear some answers about what's happening. But my question is, why wasn't it included in here? Mm. Um, well, I mean, certainly, as you know, we're coming back in January with a report. Uh, uh, I think we've captured in the broad sense of transportation. I mean, we're obviously a community that is becoming much more mobility conscious. And when I, I use the word mobility, because it's. It's more than just LRT, it's BRT, it's traditional transit or conventional transit. It is cycling, it is walking, it's the whole picture. So, I mean, we didn't mention those things either. So, um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know that uh, uh, we have a particular focus on that topic and we will be addressing it in, in, uh, uh, in January um, as to what we think is the, you know, the most sensible answer for Hamilton. So, yeah, it's, it should have been included. It could easily have been, uh, along with everything else that we're focused on as well. No, and I, and I appreciate that answer, uh, because we do say go. We do say line A, uh, A line, B line. We do, you know, specifically yeah. AODA les legislation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But knowing what the comments have been around LRT in the community, that it doesn't. It seems to be almost an afterthought, and which is so far from the truth. That's right. I would at least have liked to have seen it specifically in a document that talks about uh, our strategic objectives. So, mm -hmm. I'll just leave that with you. Uh, the only other comment I have, or question, I guess, is uh, for the benefit of those who are are watching. Under uh, Strategic Objective 2.1, we talk about implement a value for money performance audit program. And I do see what the update is in the report farther on. But again, the value for money audit during the election, going door to door, uh, you know, we heard it hammered time and time again. The city needs to get a handle on expenses. They need to look at doing value for money, performance auditing. We passed that last spring. And I'm just wondering for the benefit uh, of those here, if you could please give an update on just exactly where we're at and perhaps what um, some options may be around that. Sure. Through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman. The, um, as you know, Ann Packrack is a, our um, auditor and is charged with the responsibility of hiring an individual, uh, I believe, on a three-year contract basis uh, to undertake a uh, value for uh, money or a value for money uh, work on behalf of this committee. Um, the individual, uh, we're having some difficulty in, in finding the right person given the, uh, the duration of the employment and the, and the, um, the salary that's being offered. Um, my understanding is, is that she's gone back to the market to, uh, to see uh, whether or not we can in fact uh, land someone on this. Uh, I expect that we'll be having an update to you, um, I would hope in December, and I'll talk to Anne about that. But uh, in terms of uh, the importance of it, I mean, this committee has been abundantly clear as to uh, why we want to go down this path. And uh, so it's not a question of if, or it's more of a question of when will we have this person on board. And at that point, we will be in front of you in terms of some of the ideas that we think uh, or Anne thinks uh, may be worth uh, turning this person's mind to, of which that will be in your control as well as to what it is specifically they, they start investigating. And Deputy Mayor, um, thank you for that, Chris. Uh, and I guess the, the other point to make is that we know we're entering into an operational review right now. Um, I would like to have seen the value for money audit process being started because I really do see the two of them linked together. You're going to do an operational review and try and identify where you can save money. Um, that audit really speaks to part of that. Mm -hmm. And through that performance audit, being able to identify uh, where could we be doing better, where, where are some issues within our um, uh, processes that we could tweak or perhaps save a few hundred thousand dollars or more. We don't know that. So until we get started on that, and, and uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I just see that as being 
uh, an, an incredibly urgent mm. issue that we need to address. So um, I'll leave that with you. But thank you. An excellent report. Thank well you done much. by everybody who worked on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Partridge. We now have Councillor Whitehead, Clark, and then Farr. Councillor Whitehead, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I want to uh, certainly congratulate uh, the city manager and all staff. I think Thanks. it's a very comprehensive report. It sets a nice foundation to uh, uh, move toward, uh, forward with, so I really appreciate the, uh, all the things it uh, entails. Uh, I want to just comment on the audit thing. Obviously, the value for audit was been since I've been elected. That's been my pet peeve project, and initiate the, uh, the the motion last term of council. I want to thank Councillor Clark as well, because Councillor Clark was uh, the chair of the audit uh, finance committee and worked with staff uh, and looked at models. And I guess my only concern at this point is if, in fact, the limitations on the model is starting to be realized as a result of the delay of actually fulfilling the, uh, that objective. Then shouldn't we have a report coming back to uh, the appropriate committee and council uh, to say maybe we need to take a, a look at a, either a different model or up the, the salary or, or expectation, whatever. But I haven't seen any reports yet. You know, months and months and months have passed by and we don't have it implemented yet. So I guess I, I agree with Councillor Partridge that it's getting a little frustrating uh, when this has been a priority for many years. Uh, thought we were finally getting, uh, uh, you know, finally getting hit the rubber on the road and, and yet we're still waiting. So uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, right after this meeting, I will uh, obviously get a hold of Anne and, uh, and get, uh, uh, get from her an idea as to when we can get that information in front of you. I know we've had some difficulty uh, for the reasons that I pointed out, but uh, we understand that uh, your patience is getting tried here um, and that uh, but I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know Ann as well as I do. I mean, she's uh, uh, as diligent a worker as we have in the organization, and uh, I'm sure that she'll be able to explain exactly what it is that she needs if she needs anything, um, and uh, and come to the appropriate committee to ask for whatever it is that uh, is missing, uh, if in fact there's something missing. So um, we'll get that update to you uh, ASAP. Appreciate that. The other uh, comment on the intergovernmental affairs. Uh, uh, I want to echo some of the comments made earlier. In fact, Councillor Develle and, and Councillor Powers just came back from Ottawa, and he want to see an example of as successful a lobby as a lobby could be. I mean, results are still uh, uh, yet to be seen, um, but there has been successes in the past with the same approach, uh, with the Green Fund, the Infrastructure Fund, and so forth. Um, and the one thing I learned uh, over the, this last uh, week in Ottawa, other than meeting with 200 ministers, uh, sorry, MPs and ministers and so forth in groups of three uh, and, and having talking details and talking points and really focusing like a laser beam on what the issues are and keeping it very simple mm. uh, is that uh, it was clear uh, that staff cannot be involved with uh, that process. They can be involved as resources but they cannot be uh, part of the dialogue or discussion. Uh, staff FCM indicate to us that they would be in a conflict. Uh, if they were uh, lobbying uh, a politician, a happy politician to politician. On the lobby registry, that's the only exception. Politicians can lobby politicians. But if you're not a politician, then you can't lobby. So I just want to make sure that we are aware that that's the rule sort of the federal level. I'm sure it's probably pretty consistent at the provincial level as well. But there are mechanisms uh, for the staff to work with deputy ministers and, and appropriate staff in detailing and backgrounding information. So I thought it was a, uh, um, a good briefing we had uh, while we were in Ottawa and some of these details came out. Uh, and the last piece is the uh, citizen engagement. And I guess. Uh, citizen engagement, I mean, if you have 80 people show up uh, at a community meeting, that's great. The reality, though, I've, I host a 22 community meetings a year, I have a tax meeting, and what happens, and that's why I broke it down to smaller components, is because you get a number of people that basically dominate the discussion and intimidate others, and they feel they don't have a voice, and they're discouraged, and so they don't attend. So I've started breaking it down and going to individual neighborhoods and having those individual discussions, and they feel more empowered to talk about issues that may not be in concurrence with uh, a loud minority at a, a larger meeting. So I think the way the things is very important in engagement, and there are tools out there. Uh, and a good example is the virtual uh, town hall meetings that seem to be met with success, because you're not dealing with just the, uh, I guess the, the, the loud individuals that have 
an axe to grind, you're really uh, uh, ad hocly spreading out the, uh, the opportunity to a broader community that may not have accessibility to council chambers, may not have access to, uh, uh, to the neighborhood meeting, but can pick up a phone and participate in the discussion. And there's much more balance in those kinds of discussions, a lot more engagement because now they feel that they're not being shut out of a, a out of a discussion. So I think we need to take a look at u utilization of technologies and 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 uh, and move forward in regards to citizen engagement. Because if you don't, you will continue having what some people refer to as the loud minority showing up to the meetings and dominating and it's discouraging uh, the louder or sorry the quiet majority. And that's always been a concern in citizen engagement. Yeah. Uh, so no question there. Notice all the latitude, right? Uh, next on the list, Councillor Clark for Johnson and Jackson. Councillor Clark. Councillor Clark. Thank you, um, Deputy Mayor. Um, perhaps my question is tangential to what Councillor McCaddy brought up earlier today with regards to LRT. Um, I'm, I need to get some clarification because my understanding of the AMO conference or convention or whatever they call that thing, um, not meaning that thing disparagingly. <laughs> that didn't sound right, did it? <laughs> that thing. Um, when you all get together, have your talk down there in Toronto? Um, that was in August, wasn't it? Okay. I've been told by some of my colleagues at Queen's Park that politicians in Hamilton were told at AMO that our LRT portion will be 30%. And yet, I've not seen anything around this table. So, I need to understand what's going on. Oh, please. Uh, is that a question to <laughs> the mayor? Desperately. <laughs> oh, uh, mayor Bertino. Deputy Mayor, the minister made it clear that Funding formula will involve uh, three partners. The suggestion was uh, that we look to the Kitchener model as the general sense of how this is going to play out. But nothing definitive will occur until June of 2013 when the Metrolinks, uh, Metrolinks is required by legislation to present their $50 billion package and the funding model that goes along with it. Uh, other meetings that I've had with the mayor of North Vancouver and others uh, with dealing with transit projects across the country, through you, Deputy Mayor, all point to the need to acquaint the public with the requirement for, for investment at all levels of government to see that uh, the transit uh, issues are funded properly. So the question earlier had been whether there would be, whether Metrolinx had promised a 100% funding model. And it's obvious that any transit project that we do, be it LRT, BRT, whatever it is, will be uh, funded by three levels of government. So there will, we will be participating in the cost of an LRT. What the specifics are through you, uh, Councillor, I can't say, but it, it was being made very clear by the minister and others that it's going to be a three-way funding. I don't know if that helps or not. Councillor Clark. Well, it's, it's, it's getting there because uh, my understanding it was Minister Chiarelli and Wynn that were involved and they made it very clear that it was 30% and they scoffed at the message that the city of Hamilton was under the impression that anyone at Queen's Park promised them 100% funding. And there was no defense to that. It's just dropped. So my frustration is that, um, as I understand it, there was at least four or five pages of documents that we had where they very clearly indicated it was 100% funding. Here's an opportunity to talk to the two ministers that are involved. They're trying to push a 30%. And when they ask where this comes from, no one bothers to defend Hamilton's position that, well, it didn't come from Hamilton. The promise to fund it 100% came from your premier. And here's the documents for it. 
So that happened in August, and now we're sitting here coming up on December. We've wasted a significant amount of time now trying to correct the record with the provincial government and deal with it in a more appropriate way. On that point, Mr. Murray, I, I recall as well the capital being 100% promised and paid for by the province. Can you just elaborate on that and, and and reconcile what's being mentioned? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, I, mean, I recall Metrolinx was present here, I believe it was last fall. Uh, uh, October, uh, there was a presentation that uh, John Howe uh, attended and I think the question was from Councillor Ferguson specifically about assuming going forward that the uh, the, the cost of uh, LRT in Hamilton would be 100% funded and I think the response from Mr. Howe was positive at that point in time that that was still the situation so I think that's what you heard. Uh, I think uh, Mayor Bertina and because I was at the meeting with him uh, at AMO, uh, what we heard from the minister is, is as Mayor Bertina states, it was uh, more in line with uh, three levels of government uh, contributing um, and that uh, uh, the, the notion as I left that meeting my own, in my own mind was that uh, uh, that was clearly a different message than what we had heard before. Um, so in terms of what the percentage breakdown is, uh, you know, certainly there was some reference, as Mayor Bertina points out, to the Kitchener-Waterloo situation, which was a third, a third, a third. Um, but uh, I don't think it was as uh, uh, the statements that were at that meeting weren't as emphatic as that that's the only way of, of moving ahead with this initiative. So um, we are uh, in the situation where... Uh, Metrolinx is looking uh, to the municipalities in terms of what kinds of revenue options would they uh, entertain in order to uh, to uh, pay for uh, LRT uh, uh, development. Uh, that work is unfolding. We are bringing our report forward uh, so it's clear what our LRT, BRT uh, and so on needs are and you'll have a very clear understanding as to what the potential cost would be over the short, medium and long term. Um, what options there are to pay for it. Uh, certainly, uh, as Mayor Bertina points out, the deadline is uh, next June. Uh, so we have certainly uh, time to debate uh, what uh, revenue possibilities are there other than just uh, relying on the uh, property tax as a way in which to raise the capital to pay for this. So that's as I understand it. Council Clerk. Thank you. Uh, I thank Mr. Mayor for that answer. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I'm told that the two ministers asked where the idea of the 100% funding came from and that there was no response. So did we have any documentation there to provide to them saying, listen, here's what the Premier said here, here's what you said in the election here, here's what yeah. uh, Mr. McMeekin said here, here's what Sophia Angelita said here, and here's what Mr. McQuake said here. Mr. So we have, we have access so to So through to you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, the uh, and I would you know would go back to our, our staff that are here and, and and obviously our clerk as to whether or not we've got any letter on record that emphatically says that it's a hundred percent. I mean to be honest, I don't recall reading such a letter. Uh, so I mean I know this has been something that's been raised in this chamber many times as to our understanding. Um, that isn't to suggest that there isn't something uh, that points out uh, that is 100%, but I don't recall ever seeing it. So unless, Rob, you can recall differently, I'd appreciate any comment. Yeah, we don't need to go to the staff because I presented the evidence to the council of myself. But I would like to know, the, I would like to know Rob's response to this. Uh, Rob? For you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, I think the councillor is quite correct. So we're doing a report on the Metrolinx investment strategy, and one of the issues and principles that we're talking about is what should be the municipal contribution. So we've reviewed what the budget statements uh, said when those programs uh, of the big move were announced. We also reviewed what the five projects that have been funded to date and all those indicated, uh, especially the five, the big five of the 12 projects that have been done to date, were all at 100%. Uh, so I think as Chris and as the mayor pointed out, I think the two may be changing on that, but clearly the, the previous evidence, and I think Councillor Clark has talked to it ab about before, was when this came out in the budget statements of 07 and 08 and the five projects funded to date, they have all been uh, 100%. And that was always my understanding as well. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, 
I don't, I don't have any. I'm incredibly exasperated right now. To find out that this happened in August, to find out that it was a 100% different response to what this council had knows and had been dealing with. As a matter of fact, during the last election, those documents, we made them public and reminded everyone. Perhaps it impacted the election in Hamilton. I know not everyone agreed with, with us making those things public, but the fact of the matter is we were made promises, we were made guarantees, and then to have a minister, and with the greatest respect, when a minister says to you that is going to be tripartite funding, comes out to roughly 30%, 33 and a third. So I hear the minister says, and I told him it's going to be 30%, we haven't heard that until I raised the question today. So how do we, with the greatest, I'm incredibly disappointed, because we can't do our job as advocates in this community if we're not kept informed. And to find out this information from people at Queen's Park, it's just incredibly irritating. Okay, I don't uh, care if we have a report coming in January, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and I'll shut up now. No, no, I'm not asking you to. I just on that point, though, Chris, can you just elaborate on the one third, one third, one third issue? I think that that's is it evolving to that? Um, can you just elaborate on that? Um, I can't say, you know, uh, uh, definitively that it's evolving to that because the my only understanding, uh, based on the meeting I attended, uh, was that that was used as an example. I mean that it's it's not uh, you know unusual that in you know uh, infrastructure funding that you have a, a third a third a third as the approach. Um, so to say conclusively that that will be the ultimate deal that is uh, take it or leave it. Um, not uh, I don't have anything to say that that's the way it will be. Okay, uh, that's an important distinction. So, uh, Mayor Bertino. Yeah, on the on the point, the, I believe the day that I returned, I emailed to everyone the points that we brought forward in our various ministerial meetings and the outcomes. So I'm surprised that it's just news today because I'll go find that document. But And I believe it was published too. That looks like it's a third, a third, a third. So that's what it is. Okay. So what we're, I guess what we're hearing then is from, a, from the bureaucracy, we're saying we're hearing it's not definitive. Mayor Bertini, you're saying it is definitive. Is that correct? No. Well, my conversations through you, Deputy Mayor, with highly placed officials in the organization, the relevant organizations are, and Hazel McCallion made this point in the Big City Mayor's Caucus. She said, they say they're going to give 50, they're going to have $50 billion budgeted uh, in 2013 for the transit projects for the big move. Hands up, anybody knows where they're going to get the money from. The fact is that the big move came out in 2007, and something happened in 2008 that changed everything. Now, whether there's a document that, that swears that Hamilton is going to get 100% funding of an LRT or not, we're, different, we're dealing with a different reality, and we can make all the noise we want. The fact is, there will be a municipal contribution. Okay, um, Mr. Murray, I guess what, what we, should, we should not be leaving here today believing that that is definitive though, is that correct? So there might be a political, there might be a political aspect as well as a, a bureaucratic one. So from your perspective, your understanding yeah. and definitively, how do we walk away from this meeting believing, what, what should we believe on this particular issue at present? I've a few things I believe. <laughs> to you, Mr. Chairman, I mean, first of all, when the Minister of Transportation Infrastructure, you know, points, you, points us to a model that that um, resulted in a third, a third, a third funding, I mean, it indicates that there's going to be some role for all three levels of government. I mean, I, I took that away from the meeting. In terms of definitive statement at that meeting saying there is no way LRT will occur without each level of government paying a third, that was not said. Okay. okay, I did not hear that. That was not what I left there understanding. Now, whether or not that in their heart of hearts is in fact the situation, uh, that's not what I heard that day. Okay. So where this is evolving to in terms of the cost sharing, 
that remains to be seen. Uh, and so just, you know, in terms of what I heard and what I walked away with, that pretty well sums it up. All right, so that, that's an important distinction as well. So moving on now, I have on the list, Councillors Farr, Jackson, Powers, Whitehead, and McCaddy, and Clark for a second time. Okay, uh, so now Councillor, I'm sorry, Councillor Powers. And can we resolve the LRT issue first and then get back the reason why Mr. Murray's presenting is this I, I believe I believe they do want to speak on the LRT. That's a list of, uh, that's been developed on this particular issue. Okay, so if, if you're def defining that list, Yes. Then I want to talk about the LRT issue. Okay, so I'll put you on that list then. So, well, we're going to have to allow this to some time to land. So I'm going to allow, there's not to be a debate, but questions. So, Mayor Bertina, do you have a question related to this issue? No. Councillor Farr. I do have, I uh, uh, do have now a, a comment and a question to uh, raise with respect to this issue. However, when I originally raised my hand, it was for slide four on a different topic altogether. So I would be behind, I think, a couple of... Okay, so you're, still you're not the on the issue, LRT then. Put me on the LRT On list. the LRT issue, Councillor Jackson. No. Um, <laughs> on the LRT issue, <laughs> Councillor Powers. The only issue that I want to raise is, is a number of months ago and just confirming that uh, the, the provincial government of the day, which still is the day, had given direction to Metrolinx with regards to the development of their $50 billion plan is that they were to look and in any discussions with municipalities investigate bearing funding ability. So whether it's a matter of you know, adding a, a, a nickel to, so in other words, if LRT was determined the direction to maybe add a dedicated nickel or something like that. So every scenario was open for discussions in order to allow the discussions to continue. And we allowed that to proceed. Otherwise, we would have basically, we would have come to a stop with our ensuing discussions with Metrolinx. So we collectively as a council allowed Mr. Murray or the, te the, the team having those discussions with LRT to discuss. Ultimately, when I'm going to say the, um, the options for the fundings, whether it's 100% or otherwise, will come back to us at that time, as alluded to by the, by the mayor, when it ultimately finds its way to the Metrolinx board to determine how the pie's going to be cut. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Powers. On the LRT issue, Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, in Ottawa, LaBelle made an announcement there'll be no new dollars for transportation period from the federal government. So obviously the, there's no capacity building uh, to facilitate the LRT. The second piece is... Uh, correct, sorry. The, the second piece is uh, that the, 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 ho the horse has already been let out of the barn. They've already funded 100% uh, uh, projects in Toronto and Mississauga. So to, uh, and, and one of the discussions at FCM is about have not have and have not uh, municipalities, and we need to recognize that. So there's, uh, there are municipalities that have the ability to do, uh, bring matching funds to the table, and there's uh, municipalities that don't, and we need to recognize that. At least that's some, the discussion, the narrative that's taking place in Ottawa. Certainly, it's, it's 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 something that's consistent and should be part of the narrative on the LRT as a, a, on a go forward basis. So I certainly wait for. An, uh, uh, the AMO and, and, and the promise to, to respond, but to, to suggest a one-third, one-third model is something that, uh, in the big moves, and you know, to suggest that Waterloo was part of the big moves is, is, is absolutely wrong. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. So that would have been a separate uh, uh, model. But certainly Hamilton was part of the big move uh, uh, announcement and part of the big move uh, commitment. And at no time in the, in, the, in the front end of the big move was it ever indicated that we would be funded any at less than 100%. So. Uh, it is concerning that uh, the, 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 it seems, seems to be shifting, but I hope that uh, we continue uh, putting the healthy tension on the province that you can't you know, take some communities and fund them at 100 percent and then take communities that don't have the same capacity and, and then make them pay. It just doesn't make sense. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead. Now on LRT, we have Councillor Farr, and then I'm going back to the strap hand. Oh, you, okay. 
Councilor Farr, then Councilor McCaddy. Councilor Farr. Then that's the point I wanted to make. I actually uh, transcribed the October 13th meeting with Mr. Howe and Rossini had a report and there was many others. And that uh, transcription I, I left on the word file at home, but one that I'm bringing to our LRT task force where we're uh, moving towards uh, lobbying and, and, and uh, stepping it up, much like uh, communities like Mississauga are already doing with respect to, uh, to Queen's Park. And we'll have discussions tomorrow morning, Mr. Chairman, obviously, around the fact that uh, the $50 billion big move is still in play. By all accounts, uh, it hasn't been scrapped yet by the provincial government. That's $2 billion a year over 25 years, and that's what we know. What we know from the transcription, too, and to Terry's, to Councillor Whitehead, uh, a, a point that he just made, um, you know, Ferguson did ask the question, and, uh, and uh, then I elaborated a little bit later and used the Waterloo analogy, and, and John Howe was specific in saying that uh, Waterloo is out of the Metrolinx catchment area. Hamilton is in that catchment area. And uh, Ferguson um, referenced the five projects that already had been committed to with respect to 100% capital funding. Uh, five Metrolinx uh, projects in Toronto that had already been committed to. Mr. Howe was uh, very, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, he said stuff like, I'm very bullish on Hamilton. He was encouraging us, as you may all recall, on October the 13th to continue with this, uh, 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 making the case study, get it done. Uh, we're very supportive of Hamilton, and, and he reiterated that you fall within the catchment area. So when asked specifically and directly the question, will we get 100 percent funding, uh, capital funding for our project, our LRT project, that was his answer. I mean, it's as good as a, you're good to go, as far as I'm concerned, and it's certainly something as we move forward with this, with this LRT task force that, you know, I'll be sharing with uh, whomever it is we speak to in Toronto, and I'll, I'll look forward to that, because, uh, oh you know, I think we have some expectations here, and we have some needs here, so I'll, I'll look forward to that, but I just want to confirm through you, Mr. Chair, to Chris, we have not heard that the billion-dollar big move officially, uh, provincially, has been scrapped. Through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, absolutely right. We have not heard that. Okay. Thank you. And lastly, on the LRT issue, Councilman McCaddy. Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, I think in the short term, we're, we're looking forward to the report from staff. I understand it's uh, mid to late January. Correct. Pretty straightforward report, uh, if, from my understanding. It's simply the, the final design for the Hamilton system. We've been working on that for about three years now, or over three years. Uh, so we'll have the final design and and the uh, recommendation, I'm guessing, is going to, going to be to send that off to uh, Metrolinx in the province. So that's something we're going to want to do, uh, capitalizing on all that hard work over the last three years. And then we may, of course, want to attach other recommendations to that uh, around funding or our expectations or, or next steps, uh, uh, rather than just, just sending the, you know, the technical details. Uh, so that's, that's the discussion, I think, for mid, mid to late January. But, uh, Councillor Farr and I will raise uh, the funding question at the LRT task force tomorrow morning, or tomorrow, whenever it is, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, eight thirty tomorrow morning, and uh, and uh, I mean that's part of the government relations strategy as well, right? And and the, the LRT task force is going to be working on a government relations strategy. Uh, guys like David Adames and uh, uh, fellows from MAC and, and others. Uh, so we'll be bringing all that back to to this table. So I think there is that opportunity. Uh, uh, who knows at this point how it's going to play out? Uh, you know, you hear hear all kinds of stuff. Uh, you know what was said, uh, and Councillor Farr spent a lot of time uh, transcribing that uh, October discussion involving John Howe. So, you know, he said what he said, and, and we've got that. And it sounds like Rob has additional information as well. And and no, uh, the mayor did report to us following his trip to Ottawa or to uh, Queens Park, uh, or was it in Ottawa? Uh, uh, when he came back, so we, we know that as well. Uh, so the, the question is, you know, the original pot of money was 100% capital funding, and now they're going to say the next allocation, the next tranche, to you, the word they always use, is going to be different. You know, we, we don't know the answer to that, but we need to find it out. Uh, so that's that's what we need to focus on, I think, uh, in, the, uh, in the weeks ahead. And I think that's what we've been able to smoke out, but I think formally someone should direct or provide that direction as well. So, Councillor Farr? And then Mayor Bertina on the LRT, and I'm hoping some. Uh, no, then then Mayor Mayor Bertina. Yeah, just quickly, uh, no one ever thought that Waterloo was part of Metrolinx. We know that's a separate project. The minister simply pointed to Waterloo as a funding model. Okay. Secondly, if 
we are getting 100% funding. Because remember, there are two there are two piles of money. One real, the first five uh, projects were done under an 11 billion dollar uh, fund, and the next group of projects were going to be announced after they figure out how to get the money in 2013. So there was no 50 billion dollars from which to draw the money. Finally, if we're in for 100 percent, why have we spent five million dollars of our own money so far on this project? It might be worthwhile to send Metrolinx a request to get the five million dollars back if the 100 percent funding is in place. Those are my comments. Now, Mr. Murray, before we wrap to sell our TV aspect up, I, I think it's important that we provide some sort of direction to, cl to provide some clarity in a very near future on this particular issue. What do you need from us from a formal direction uh, to do just that? Would you like to provide that direction? <laughs> I, I don't know if I need any direction to be clear. Fair enough. Honest. That's all I need to hear. Councillor Clark. How much money did uh, Metrolinx provide us specifically for the quick start on the LRT? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we were provided uh, $29 million through the Quick Wins program of Metrolinx, which was that first part, $11.5 billion of transit projects that have been funded by the And province. the money which the Mayor is talking about, do you have any idea in terms of what the $5 million that we spent out of our own money? which means we're willing to spend our own money on LRT, which is the extrapolation of the statement. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, yes, if you recall in the report that we did on October 2011, so around uh, last year, we did update Council that at the time we had spent, uh, at that time, about $8.1 million, $3 million from uh, special funding that we got from Metrolinx for, to do all the studies, and about $4 million of our own money uh, that was funded in the 9, 10, and 11 capital budgets. And then at that report last year also added another $965,000, uh, which we funded from the interest earned from the Quick Wins uh, Reserve. So in total, we have spent $5 million of our own money. And the money was spent on our staff manning an LRT office to manage the program? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So our money was spent on that, plus there was the consultant, uh, Steer Davies Gleaves, uh, and then also all the communications around that, the open houses, uh, but primarily it was the staff team. And I think we did provide in that report back in October a breakdown of how much was in operating, how much was in capital. I just don't have that number in front of me right now. Yeah. I hear that old expression, Mr. Hughes. At reductio ad absurdum, I think that's what we just heard from our Chief Magistrate. Uh, thank you, Councillor Clark. Um, and on that point, then, we're going to move on now to the strategic plan presentation. And on that list, we have Councillor Jackson for, and on that particular list, Councillor Jackson, the floor is yours. You can indeed, <laughs> or you may indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Wonderful meeting so far. Um, uh, Mr. City Manager, congratulations. Uh, first ever uh, multi-departmental business plan brought forward corporately by SMT through your leadership. Thank you for that. Um, I'm sure General Manager McCabe and MOH Dr. Richardson will get some good-natured ribbing from the rest of their SMT colleagues for being referenced and complimented for leading the way, uh, but everybody's on side and everybody's on board now. That's wonderful. Um, in your recommendation, Chris, can we do a possible hybrid, Mr. Deputy Mayor? I would suggest that all of these go to the respective standing committees. And could I suggest a hybrid that all of the standing committees, after rolling up their sleeves with the departmental presentations, it come back to the collective of GIC, Chris, so that we can get the whole collective perspective, because sometimes things departmentally at a standing committee, uh, where obviously the, the committee itself is trying to be as supportive as it can to the departments reporting to it, but getting the citywide picture. I would like to see, Mr. Deputy Mayor, after it goes to the standing committees, it come back to GIC so we can see the work that all the standing committees did, because all of us don't serve on every single standing committee. So I throw that idea out there. Mr. Murray. 
Um, certainly through you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, we can roll up the um, uh, the summary the summaries from the various standing committees into a GIC presentation if you wanted us to do that before it gets approved by Council. I'll leave that to the rest of my colleagues. I'm one voice on that, but I think that that would be a prudent move. I've always enjoyed that, especially during budget time. I find that works as well. Um, Chris, um, on your table of contents, you said that on uh, page three, um, it's not the intent of the department, departmental business plan to outline all the work undertaken across the entire corporation, so therefore legislative requirements day-to-days are not part of this. Um, so Chris, when will, and you know I've been harping on this for a while, yeah. things like legislative, mandatory, discretionary, the more we tend to, Mr. Deputy Mayor, peel back on those services programs that fall into legislative, mandatory, discretionary, the more we peel back, I, th I think the more we've realized corporately and politically that there's tremendous opportunities there to still do what we've got to do to meet standards, but we don't have to do this when we can do this and maybe save the corporation money that we desperately need. So, Chris, when do you see that argument evolving, Mr. Deputy Mayor? Through to Chris. So, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, as I said, uh, the business plans are uh, great that we got them all um, at the you know start line, uh, all of them are, are done now, and all of them reflect uh, very directly to the work that's uh, uh, outlined in the strategic plan. I do think, though, the evolution of the business plans, the next time you see them, um, should be broadened out to include all the legislative uh, uh, responsibilities that the uh, departments uh, uh, are required to fulfill. Uh, but to your point about absolutely correct in that there are things that we are legislatively required to do but there is in fact some flexibility in the way in which we address what we're legislatively required to do um, so that uh, I think when we we can certainly get at it I think two ways we can get at some of those questions through the service delivery review that we're doing if there are some specific areas uh, of a, of a business that our departments are engaged in, in which you know is legislatively required that you wondered you know is there not a better way of doing it we could come at it through the service delivery or we can come at it uh, through the business plans that uh, that are going to evolve uh, next time we generate them for 2014 so um, it's probably a good question to raise at the standing committees I would think uh, when you when you see the business plans this time around um, and uh, and get uh, maybe some work uh, or get some feedback from our general managers and our medical officer of health you know list for me those areas that are legislatively required to do where there there may be a uh, some flexibility in the way in which that we do that work and and maybe that's something that you can uh, you can ask at the standing committees uh, you could ask GMs to do that now Tim's got his finger up here so just General Manager McCabe. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So that comment is meant, so we've been doing it for four, four years now. So we look at it as a strategic business plan. So you have tiers and hierarchy of, a, you have a corporate strategic plan and a strategic business plan, and then we have divisional work plan. So that comment is meant, so take planning and economic development. You never see, you don't see anywhere in here process building permits, do reports on committee of adjustment. That's our day-to-day -day work. So we'd have 500 pages if we were to put all our legislative requirements in here. These were strategic projects that were important to council or something that council's directed as part of outstanding business that we put in our strategic strategic business plans. Okay. So we do have uh, divisional work plans, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor and so Councillor Jackson, that has all our day-to-day -day type stuff too. So that's what that comment is meant to, to be there. Okay. But and Tim, so I appreciate that, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So Tim, if you're saying that it's not the right time or fit now to ask that kind of question between you and the city manager and, and the rest of your colleagues on SMT, just tell me when that right time is, because I think there's great opportunity there for this community without going hypothetically bankrupt by meeting all legislative requirements that we can't afford without senior level of government's help. What can we meet still standards, but the standard could be this instead yeah. of this, and do more with the limited dollars we have? When can I then have that discussion, Mr. Deputy Mayor? Chris, so I, I, I appreciate what Tim is saying. There's no question. If we put everything in, 
um, that you, we'd be dealing with a Sears catalog thick document for every department. So he's right about that. But I, I think I do understand your question, though. If I, you know, not to pick on uh, public health, but you know, public health is a highly regulated area of business. There is, though, the question within the areas of business that you're regulated. Is it, is it prescriptive in the sense of, of how you do that work? And in some cases, it is prescriptive as to how it is they, they meet the legislative requirement. In other cases, it's not prescriptive. And so you want to know, I think, at the end of the day, of those areas that you know our hands aren't tied in terms of how we deliver that service, what are those areas? And you know what opportunities lie within those areas to maybe do it a little bit differently that might be a little bit more cost effective. I mean, that's the one that comes to mind. I think that's a fair question, to be honest. I, I still think that those are questions that can be raised when these business plans get presented to the standing committees. I will take it up with SMT in terms of, of you know, you know, to give you some help as to you know uh, where you're going with the question because I, I certainly understand what you're saying, um, and that uh, maybe we can, uh, as general managers and the medical officer of health, uh, help provide you some guidance as to where the flexibility lies and and what you know what does it mean in terms of uh, potential efficiencies or savings we might be able to accrue. And Chris, I appreciate that. And Chris, if SMT decides that it's not the right time during the departmental business plan presentations to standing committees, just tell me then when it is. Is it during the yeah. service delivery review? Is it during this 2013 budget deliberations? Because honest folks, I, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I've been around long enough and I've always been respectful when any SMT member over the years has come for us at Councillor Legislative, Councillor Mandatory, and I've just accepted it. And then the more I've probed no, and no. pricked and kind of delved in and peeled back, well, uh, it was council approved, councillor. Oh, so the legislative meant this, but council approved meant we, we could do with just this. So I think everybody understands where I'm going with that, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So that's it. And Mr. Deputy Mayor, if you'd come back to me then when we get to 7 1, that all these reports would be referred to standing committees for approval. If I could get a seconder, I would just ask after that process that it be all come back for the collective summary to GIC. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. On that point, Councillor Clark. I had heard <laughs> Councillor Jackson indicate that earlier. I was going to call a point of order, but now's as good a time as I am. I'm trying to, in my mind, figure the process because our standing committees don't report to GIC. Standing committees report to Council. Um, so you may want to have a special round of GIC to deal with the reports, and then everyone's present for it. But I, I'm I believe we can sort of amending our, our procedural bylaws. I'm not sure how we can start kicking stuff to GIC and to Council. That's three debates on the same. Madam item. Clerk, on that point, Madam Clerk. Through the chair, yes, Councillor Clark is, is correct in, in indicating that standing committees do not report back to GIC. Those standing committee reports are presented to Council. Uh, what what can be. Uh, perhaps as a solution Sorry, is that the business plans can be put on um, each standing committee within the same cycle, within the same week, so that members of council will be available to attend the respective, stand, re respective standing committees that they're uh, interested in or, or wish to hear the presentations on. Councillor Clark, uh, Jackson, sorry. Mr. Deputy Mayor, I really appreciate Councillor Clark pointing out that procedural nuance. I was just told, I just thought, I wanted the opportunity at this collective body, but the procedural nuance is in place, so let's leave well enough alone at this time. If at council everybody goes, you know what, let's refer this back to GIC, then I'm on for that at that time. So I'll wait at that time, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I'll stay with what's recommended in the report. Thank okay, you. Okay, fair enough. Thank you, Councillor Jackson and Clark. Moving on now, we the next speaker is Councillor Farr. Just one question, Mr. Chair, and it's to Chris, and I think we can probably end on a on a light and positive note with respect to slide number four, this shows the legend of the three uh, criteria. It shows that uh, with respect to the, I guess it's 64 strategic actions, six are completed and I would hate to see a negative headline or, or press tomorrow on, on council receiving strategic plan progress update, only six completed. When I look more closely at this list, and, and this is through you to Chris, with the check mark of 53 in progress, and even more specifically, Chris, when I look at the uh, strategic objective 1.3, promoting economic opportunities with a focus on Hamilton's core, downtown areas, and waterfronts, we are so close. I mean, we're going to go from six to 
many, many more in short order. And I'm wondering if you can offer sort of a ballpark percentage on in the next six months mm. what that six turns into. And obviously this is an estimated guess, but I can see we're so close on stuff like Randall Reef setting sail in the OMB, uh, Pier 7 and 8 right around the corner. Yeah. A lot of great work by a myriad of qualified staff, which I think is important to highlight too. They've done a terrific job in, in uh, going after these objectives. So can you give, give us a rough idea of when that number six turns to a much bigger number in, yeah. in short order through the chair? Well, I, I would expect, because there's two years left, I mean, we had committed to only looking at those actions that we felt we could get done in this term of council. And as you point out, council, these are substantial actions that we're undertaking. You know, I would expect to see at least a, you know, a few hundred percent increase in 2013 in terms of what gets done. Um, you know, I think the important thing is, is that I, I see no reason for us not to have everything done as we had committed to in this term of council. So um, again, we got the green light in April. Um, you know, we've got some, uh, we got, uh, you know, maybe a better way of looking at it is, uh, you know, we have over 90% of the actions either underway or completed, uh, and that uh, the other ones, the other uh, uh, the other five, have not yet started. In fact, we touched upon one of them here today, and that is the financial sustainability plan, which, as you know, uh, you're going to start to see something in the next uh, two quarters on that. So, um, you know, the important thing is is that we got to focus. We know what we're working on. We got the staff uh, applied to those areas. They're already making uh, progress. We expect significant pro progress next year, and we expect to get it all done before you go to the uh, polls. So, thank you. On the, on that note, may I have a motion to receive the presentation moved by Colin, second by Far. All in favor? Carried. carried. Fabulous job, uh, Mr. Murray. Thank you. I will now, Mr. Uh, Councilor Clark. Just, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, just uh, if I can just take a quick moment. I'm not sure whether or not I create a, a problem for one of the media. The other day I was in the planning, and Mr. Coleman was trying to find a place to set up his camera, and I originally suggested on that side. I was in the chair, and then he kind of blocked off the staff. We pushed him back to the point where he was almost out on the balcony. Um, and then we came up on this side. Um, I'm not sure if there, this is breaching any policy, but I see another media sit stand over there. But one of our colleagues had looked it, like it's perfectly point. acceptable from my perspective. Thank Madam, you. Madam Clerk, uh, is there anything? They were on the outside of the barrier, which is where Fine. the media is. Fine. Is that a spectator's area there? Is that correct? Madam Clerk? Uh, through the chair, as long as it's not disruptive to the proceedings of the meetings, I believe that it is all, all right. All right. Fair enough. Thank, Thank you. you. I didn't want to get you in hot water. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on. I now uh, call on uh, Chris Phillips and Steve uh, Bonhart to provide a presentation on waterfront and shoreline initiatives and priorities update. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Um, actually, if this uh, presentation kind of follows, uh, follows nicely with uh, Councillor Fogger's comments and the strategic plan, uh, because today's uh, presentation obviously kind of picks up on some of what he just said. Over the course of the past decade, the city has made great strides, obviously in laying a foundation for the waterfront development and redevelopment in a variety of wide-ranging projects, whether they're from uh, from planning elements to actual projects in built form. But subsequently, staff have presented several reports over the past dealing with the waterfront and shoreline. And today's presentation is really meant to try to close a loop on many of those past discussions and really close a loop on some of the action items that are in the strategic plan specifically by providing you with a review of how we've collectively coordinated our, our actions, how we're focusing on this area, and what we've accomplished to date as well as looking at a few next steps. So this is, uh, this is just an overview of uh, some of how we're going to approach today's uh, brief presentation. 
specifically, I want to kind of say that Council's uh, senior management team and the various departments, as you saw through uh, Mr. Murray's presentation, uh, have been involved in many aspects of the waterfront. It, w there's many things that have been ongoing, many things that are just starting, and many things still, still to come. Things like planning processes such as setting sail, the rec uh, Harbor Recreational Master Plan, and the Confederation Park Master Plans. Um, some very key specific things, like the city's acquisition of key properties within the Barton Tiffany area, negotiating uh, the termination of Piers uh, 7 and 8 from the Hamilton Port Authority, as well as many other kind of um, staff teams that are relating to uh, some uh, projects down there, as well as the Waterfront Trust on a project by project basis. And all this has really caused a renewed interest and excitement down in the area, interest by residents, families, and the value that this great area could actually have for, for the entire community. And with that said, therefore, collectively, council and staff solidified this with the actions that you see above you in the strat plan that Mr. Murray just kind of presented to you. As a highlight of the relevant sections of the strat plan on this slide, I want to draw to, you, to your attention, one of the key things of this is that all of these items are actually direct action items. Unlike some other elements in the, um, in the strap plan that are fairly broad and fairly um, wide ranging and long term, some of these very specific things are, uh, are action items in and of themselves. That's why you see words like finalize, downtown servicing strategy, negotiate the early termination, complete the rec master plan, uh, indicate development on the West Harbor, and uh, to, to get it to a developed commercial business strategy for the Confederation Park areas. So the keys to the strat plan on these items are that many of them are actually action oriented and very specific things have been done to start to move us along. So what are some of these key action items to date? And here's a, here's a list of just a few. But I think a list, uh, a list of them just on paper isn't really enough to kind of really do it justice and see that the collection of the items that we've worked on uh, and the collection of actions that are actually in place, what they actually mean and how they see the area develop. So I'm just going to highlight some quick ones here that are, um, are actions that are in process and overlaying them onto a graphic of, in this case, the West Harbor. Planning, led by Michelle Sergi and, uh, and uh, Alyssa Mahood, they've been instrumental in moving forward the setting sale secondary plan through the process at the Ontario Municipal Board. This is a long-standing issue and it's coming to conclusion. Why is this important? Well, because this will provide the land use and planning certainty for investors looking to actually build within this entire boundary that we're in here. Secondly, the Barton Tiffany city-owned lands. This council in particular took a tremendous leadership by assembling and acquiring a significant amount of land within this area. Regardless of the reasons or what could have been, the city's a major landowner within the area. Although the final development plans and concepts, and were alluded to by Councillor Collins earlier on, um, have not been finalized at this point, I think it's critical to show that within the months and uh, months to come, this critical land and the fact that we own it is key to kind of moving the city forward. West Harbor Recreational Master Plan was approved by uh, or, or was endorsed by council and really kind of lays out the concept of how the area of the West Harbor uh, will will develop, what the land uses are, what the public space is in the public realm. And we've kind of taken it to kind of overlay it here onto the map so that you can kind of see what exactly this thing looks like and how it will kind of reflect into the broader neighborhood. Specifically, this one shows up at the very top. It's been alluded to before. Under the direction of the city manager, a team consisting of myself, Al Dorf, and uh, Al Dorf from Public Works and city treasurer, Tony Tolis, we've been actively engaged in establishing um, a memorandum of understanding between the city and the Hamilton Port Authority for the future of the Piers 7 and 8 lands. Like the Barton Tiffany lands, this agreement will allow us to move forward much quicker than otherwise would have been because we now actually own and control the lands that are in there. As a basis of that, this council uh, directed staff to conduct a Piers uh, a servicing study and a servicing strategy specifically for the Piers 5, 6, 7 and 8 area. 
these studies are currently underway. And what the key is for these is that they'll, when they'll allow us to figure out how to actually make the development happen. It'll look at those hard services like roads, like water, wastewater, remediation, and get us to a point so that we can explore exactly how you can implement these, uh, uh, these developments. But considering that we're in this area down here, um, there are all sorts of other actions, and the STRAP plan kind of, kind of focused on it as well, that are in this particular piece of the world, this, this geographic area. So I'm gonna highlight just a few so that you know that not only is the waterfront acting in and of itself in a bubble, but that we're also looking and know that, that what the actions that we're taking and the moves that we're making are actually affecting and are interrelated to other aspects. For instance, the neighborhood plan that's been established uh, earlier on. It, two of the specific neighborhoods fall within this land area. The GO station proposed for James Street North is a key integral piece of infrastructure and public infrastructure at that that will also be in the area. As well as not to be forgotten, things like parks that we own and, and have control of, and specifically other agencies that we have. City Housing Hamilton, for instance, has two key properties in this area to show that affordable housing is important in this entire broad um, uh, waterfront area. So with that said, this is kind of designed to show, although not exhaustive, and although there's lots of other work happening within the area in all sorts of departments, this kind of shows you the complexity of building together the plan so that it's, a, it's more than just a collection of projects. That it's actually a plan of attack to actually take the entire West Harbor neighborhood and move it forward. Not to, be, uh, not to be outdone, because this really is typical and the strat plan calls for this, the waterfront and shoreline area was worded that way specifically to take advantage of the fact that we actually do have both the waterfront and the West Harbor, as well as the Lake Ontario shoreline on the East Harbor. And so the, the uh, Confederation Master Plan that was uh, received a, um, a couple of years ago, I believe 2010, kind of indicates that the same sort of planning is taking place on the east side as well, and so that it's not just the West Harbor, but the entire area. So overall, the result of this is, and, and you saw through this draft plan, but I want to re, uh, I, I want to um, um, ensure that we enforce the fact that together, corporately, we have taken the waterfront priority and established it as a clear corporate objective. Every one of the general managers have agreed with this, have bought into it, and, and obviously led by, uh, by council. And specifically, they've also aligned and started to align all the assets that, that are within their, their independent uh, departments so that we're coordinating the nature of the roles. We created the Waterfront Development Office, I believe, back in, uh, back in um, uh, April, and that, uh, that is my, myself, and we'll get into to how it all functions in a couple of minutes. But I think the key to, that we want to also explore as we go forward to the actual corporate structure is to show that although coordination can happen corporately and is happening cor corporately, the expertise actually falls within the department. And with that said, before I go any further, I'm joined by a whole host of staff members and colleagues in the audience uh, who make up this, this fantastic uh, group of individuals that we'll start to get into in a second. So I'm going to kind of uh, review now this whole concept of a corporate team approach that we've taken. And I'm going to kind of do it through a typical org chart, but, uh, um, but you, you'll see how it flows. It's not a specific org chart, it's kind of showing the relationship between all the different elements. What we, what we did is we kind of built on some of the successes on uh, both the uh, how we worked forward some of the McMaster Health Campus as well as the neighborhood strategy. And we built upon the premise that Council and SMT both uh, have established this as a key priority. And then we decided how would we corporately kind of uh, utilize uh, key people and key project personnel into the corporation. So the first thing we did is we established a, uh, a uh, steering committee. That steering committee is made up of myself, Mr. Aldor, Mr. Lawrence Staziak, both from Public Works. I want to say that uh, uh, led by Jerry and uh, Rob Norman, Steve Barnhart, and, and all the collection of people from Public Works, I want to say a, a thank you to them because uh, 
in an organization that talks about breaking down silos and working together, uh, they were instrumental in actually helping piece this thing together. And that's the key element of that steering committee. I think not to be forgotten, we also understood through both the servicing studies that we were already undertaken, but a key element and a key player within the area is the Hamilton Waterfront Trust. They've acted as our project manager as it relates to the servicing studies, but most importantly, we also see them as a key resource and a key ally, and their support and their expertise is kind of embedded in many of the things that we do as far as uh, uh, external audiences. We then kind of br uh, branched out and created a collection of teams uh, throughout the, uh, the organization uh, from engineering, planning, economic development, and establishing a financing team. And as I kind of flip through some of these, you can certainly see and recognize not only the fantastic people, but the breadth of expertise that you see, both from the directorial uh, order as well as the managerial level, building all the way down to a key technical expertise within the various departments. So our planning and architectural team, our economic development team. And working with this report, we are also establishing a financing working team that will really talk about the, uh, the elements of how we actually move the plan forward in a financing basis. But not to be mistaken, this doesn't mean, and when I go back to the hierarchy, this doesn't mean that the elements that are already going on, the project teams that are already established, uh, are, not, are all of a sudden either abandoned or report through this structure. The elements here, the setting sail, um, the HPA uh, MOU, the breakwater EA and shoreline work, and the Confederation Master Plan all have their own technical teams that are working on. And then again, not to be mistaken, the fact that we're not missing the fact that the neighborhood strategy, uh, City Housing Hamilton, and items like Go Transit are also out there kind of established that we need to work with as well. With that said, we're now just going to review some of the quick ones just to show you that this isn't just been about planning. It hasn't just been about um, piecing together specific uh, um, staff members, but that we're actually working and establishing some clear actions as we move forward. The 2012-2013 projects that are currently before Council as part of the capital budget process, these are just a collection of the actual items that we're bringing forward as part of that process. I'm just going to highlight two of the two specific ones that are highlighted in red. The first one, uh, Steve Barnhard um, and his group, uh, led by Lawrence, uh, put together the REC Master Plan. And I think this is uh, important to, to look at because what it really does is it takes the REC Master Plan from just a concept and establishes how the actual projects work together and how they're actually implemented on a project-by-project -project basis. Conversely, the servicing studies that we talked about before are ongoing, and but but we've approached these services, uh, these servicing studies, in such a way that it really focuses on what we're trying to achieve, and that is we're trying to figure out the way to uh, actually f develop the lands in the area and what things need to be done in order to make the make sure the staging of that development is happened in the right order. Just to show you how detailed these studies are, this is actually a collection of the work that will be accomplished uh, as we kind of go through f with this, which focuses on everything from the basic background information and the zoning information, those types of things, the main uh, engineering work, the soils, but getting us all the way to the fact that we can get a valuation study and a cost of what potential development would actually cost you to build on the area. Understanding it's a long-term strategy, though, we've also got, uh, although the servicing studies themselves will establish a lot of the baseline information, we are looking at specific items for 2013 to 2015, with some of the 2013 projects being, being identified here. Again, looking at both West Harbor and Confederation Park. Moving into some of the more 2014 to 2015 items. All of these, obviously, will be will be uh, discussed as we kind of go through the budget processes. 
Which brings us to our outcomes and next, uh, next steps. The key to all of this to a large degree will be uh, the question of financing and how we actually uh, figure out a way on how to finance the entire waterfront and shoreline area. And, uh, and that's why we established that corporate team earlier on to, to start to look at those areas of, uh, of expertise as well as the recognition that there needs to be some element of dedicated staffing support put towards the waterfront and shoreline area initiatives so that we can move some of these things forward in a coordinated way. Just so that everybody is clear and, and uh, doesn't see that it's just plans, our, the fact is that staff are, are revolving around a very aggressive timeline in getting this to you. The studies that we are looking to build that comprehensive 10-year capital budget plan is moving forward right now. And our plan of attack is to make sure that we're coming back uh, in May, June, and leading into the 2014 budget cycle with a clear options as to how you can implement an entire waterfront and shoreline strategy over a 10-year time horizon. So that when we come back in the 2014 time horizon or the 2014 budget process, we can show you a clear 10-year action plan on how this would all unfold. And as well, uh, Public Works has committed that in, by September of 2013 that they'll uh, come back and report on the CONFED Master Plan feasibility. So with all that said, the report that you have in front of you has a recommendation which specifically talks to, to the coordinating uh, aspect of, uh, of staffing and seeks a uh, two-year contract assignment of a project manager position coming out of the uh, Economic Development Investment Fund. And with that said, Deputy Mayor. That's Thank you, uh, Mr. Phillips. Uh, we do have a few speakers in Councillor Collins, McCaddy and Jackson. Councillor Collins, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, thank Chris for the presentation. It's a, it's a really good, uh, I think, history of where we've been over the last number of years. And uh, both Chris, uh, Al, Tony, and uh, SMT, and, and certainly Chris Murray's office have done a tremendous job in terms of making the waterfront a corporate priority. In fact, you know, one of the biggest complaints that I had over the years is that through successive administrations, anytime we needed to do something on the waterfront, somebody around our political table would need to put up their hand and say, you know, we need to make this happen either from a policy or a budget perspective. And it wasn't in the corporate plan and it wasn't until uh, Mr. Murray's hiring and certainly the, the election of this council that in fact we collectively made it a corporate priority. And as Chris notes, Mr. Chairman, um, that corporate team approach that you referenced, uh, Chris, has worked very well. In fact, it, it's not just um, internally that we've sort of moved the yardsticks with some of these waterfront projects. We've worked with our partners like the Waterfront Trust, the Conservation Authority, and uh, some other public entities as well. So I, I wanted to commend uh, you, Chris, because you, you've had that file as an individual, and you've worked with the team members that you referenced earlier. Um, and I think it's also important to note, you know, it, was, it was, wasn't too long ago. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, 30 years is not a long time, and it was 30 years ago that you know, when people visited the waterfront, um, Bayfront Park in particular was a was a, um, a waste facility. It was the lax property. We had uh, municipal waste uh, dumped in, in the harbor. And so you look at over the last 30 years how, you know, we've seen so many changes with Bayfront Park, Pier, Pier 4 Park. And it was only a decade ago that if you were to travel down to, to Pier 8, it was essentially a large industrial pad for uh, industrial materials. We didn't see the Williams, we didn't see the former museum, now the restaurant, the, hot, the uh, ice rink, and, and all the other trail amenities that have been added. So our council and, and our successive administrations have, have made tremendous strides as it relates to, to waterfront development. And, and what we're lacking, and you noted here, Chris, is the next step beyond the, um, beyond the recreational component. People are looking for more commercial op opportunities and they're looking for more residential opportunities. And, um, and, and so along those lines, um, you know, my only concern with, with what you've presented is the fact that we're adding uh, a position to the organization and, and we've shared this, this privately and I, I respectfully would suggest that the corporate team approach has worked to date. We've, we've made all of the um, strides that, uh, or, and, and we've made all the progress that you've recognized here in your presentation through that model. So we've had a roundtable discussion. We attended a, a great meeting two weeks ago internally. Yeah. We had about 20 people around the table, including some transportation planners. We had, uh, uh, I believe, uh, some consultants as it relates to uh, Confederation Park and all the good things that we're doing there. We have a public meeting planned. I think it's for December the 6th. And, and I found that that roundtable discussion that we've had 
with many of the individuals that you highlighted earlier, um, it, it's working. And, and I, I'm, I'm hesitant at this point in time to add to the budget on the staffing side of things. I, I think where we fall short is on the capital budget side of things. We're struggling to pay for some of these initiatives. And so the suggestion that we might you know, take a quarter of a million dollars over two years, in my own mind, is, is a little bit problematic. And so I, I, I certainly don't want to, um, to rain on your presentation, Chris, because it is a good one. And I think we need to see more presentations like this to keep us in the loop as it relates to the progress we've made. Um, as I mentioned earlier, too, I, I'd like to see a, a charrette on that number four that you have up there, which is the, uh, the Pier 8 area. Um, you know, for as much as we have the setting sail policy, we really don't have the detailed design in terms of what the street configurations are for Pier 8, right. um, what do the buildings look like, what's the design theme. Those are some of the things we need to flush out and, and we need some additional community engagement to get us to, to cross the finish line in that area. And I think you and your team are going to play a key role in, 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 that, um, in that study. And so I, I would be prepared, Mr. Chairman, at the appropriate time to move receipt of this report and maybe provide some direction to, um, to Chris and the team to come back um, next quarter with an update in terms of where we are. I'm sure we're going to hear something through the budget process. And I know that we're making great strides with the Port Authority. So we may hear something sooner. But I think what you've presented here today is a, is a great start in terms of a regular communication that needs to be established with Council. And I, I didn't want to, to um, uh, I really want to thank staff because they have, they have done so many things over the last couple of years as it relates to our waterfront that I, uh, it's something that I always complained about. And I'll be honest with you, I really have no complaints at this point in time in terms of how you're treating it. So I, I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Collins. We now have Councillor McCaddy. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and thanks, Chris. Uh, pretty exciting to see this stuff moving ahead. Uh, just on the, the West Harbor, though, I, I think there's an um, uh, issue that, that uh, is important for me is that we, we've had lots of momentum on that project before. Uh, you know, the OMB process took so very long, and we uh, finally received a, you know, a decision by the OMB, but there's been no communication with the public uh, since that time. Uh, and. Uh, I was just, uh, Councillor Farr uh, sent a, a note over to me here about uh, the West Harbor design study or something that's going on, urban design study, and uh, that's news to me as the Ward 1 Councillor, uh, and uh, that property, as you know, is right on the Ward 1, Ward 2 uh, border. So I'm a bit surprised by that, and, and I remember I thought there was direction, or maybe it was just verbal, that we uh, entertain a sort of a across Canada or international design uh, process to try and raise some excitement and you know how many people how many uh, municipalities have that kind of property uh, uh, on their waterfront uh, I, I would suggest fairly few and we wanted to take advantage of the the profile of that property as well and so I'm a little a little confused as to what what's happening there and I, I guess mr. deputy mayor the main main concern beyond my own uh, uh, you know, not being up to speed myself as the ward councillor, uh, is that I think we're, we've we've left the public behind uh, in in what's uh, was presented today, and I'll just pick on the West Harbor as a particular example. Uh, I know people in, in Ward One are always asking what's going on with the West Harbor, and I don't have a lot to tell them uh, at this point. Uh, so I'd like to suggest, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that we hold a public meeting. Uh, uh, perhaps down in that area, maybe a combined Ward One, Ward Two meeting, if, if that's uh, if that's if it's the neighborhood kind of focus, or or a larger one, if uh, we want to and get uh, folks across the city excited about what can happen in the West Harbor. We spent an awful lot of money there. There was all the disappointment about the Thai Cat fiasco, and a lot, still a lot of bad taste in people's uh, mouths about that whole process. And I, I think we still have some work to do to turn turn that around, make it positive. I think we can do that. I'm absolutely convinced we can do that. I try and do it when I uh, speak to people, but uh, so that's a, a major concern for me, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And I, I guess we is it is it the case, uh, Chris, that that the, that the presentation we had here from the citizens group, who uh, felt that there was an opportunity to include the CN lands in in our West Harbor uh, planning, so hold off was their direction. Uh, don't move ahead on West Harbor until you. Get that uh, uh, direction. Uh, a bit of a catch-22 because we want to move ahead, as I just uh, suggested. 
So are we still waiting? Is that still hanging in the winds, uh, or in the wings, rather, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, Chris? Chris, let, let me try to, uh, through you, uh, Deputy Mayor, let me, let me try to maybe um, uh, take a couple of points at a time. And, and first to say that nothing's cut and, cut and dry in this specifically. Um, there's lots of uh, opportunity, at least from what we're in our minds, for public consultation and for more consultation with with, that, um, with council. But I do think that going right back to the strat plan, there were some key, very specific actions that were that were highlighted in those. And what we've tried to do here is show an action plan moving forward on them. It doesn't mean that they're all cut cut and dry, that we've established exactly how it'll unfold, but there are clearly elements of the plan and elements of the West Harbor development that council indicated to us to go and make actions on. Um, I assume when you're talking West Harbor lands, councilor, you're talking about number two, the Barton Tiffany block. As it relates to that, we do, uh, as part of the setting sale process, we did have to do a uh, urban design study as it relates to it. But secondarily to that, there is the fact, as I highlighted, the idea that we actually own the property. So as the landowners, we could actually engage in whatever way or whatever process that we want into how we're actually going to unfold and actually have that develop. But that's not to say that elements of the plan need to kind of carry forward specifically. Michelle Sergi and her team are kind of leading the approach of both the urban design studies themselves and how they'll unroll. But the insurance is that there's public consultation that will be built out with that. And we've yet to define exactly what that consultation was uh, as it relates to those lands there. Relating to the rest of the plan, I think what we're trying to do in this what I was trying to accomplish in this presentation was to show that there's tremendous actions happening. Some of them are just on the planning side of things. Others are on the very detailed oriented. But that the, the reality is that we're, we're moving ahead on different initiatives. As it relates to doing a public meeting, I kind of leave that to, to you and, and council to kind of direct us if need to. I'm certainly prepared to, to do this type of presentation anywhere else. Councilor McCaddy. Mr. Deputy Mayor, the, uh, the folks who said include CP, uh, what's the status of that? Um, I, if I could maybe ask Michelle, my, my understanding was that we, were, um, um, that, that we were moving ahead with the design studies as it relates to the area. And as part of that, if there was a, um, could we also look at what happens with the CN lands? But specifically going back to the actions on the, on the strap plan, it was clear that, at least I thought the direction was clear that we were moving ahead with, with trying to get a process of, of um, bringing those lands to development ready. Councilor McKetty. Okay, so what I'm hearing, Mr. Deputy Mayor, is we're moving ahead with our setting sail plan. Uh, which did not include the, CP, the CN yard because uh, CN said they didn't want to be part of that. So that, that's my understanding as well. Um, so that, that's fair enough. I guess I'll just finish off by saying uh, I need to know more as the Ward 1 Councillor, Chris. Just a message uh, to you and staff. Uh, the urban design uh, work that's going on, I've, I've not been uh, any part of that. Uh, and I, I hate to be in the situation where I have some citizens that are keen on this stuff and uh, my, my response is I have no idea what's going on, no sense of timing, uh, which it, it's hard to uh, you know, engage and, and try and build some excitement if I'm responding in that way. So I'm hoping we can uh, work together on this. Thanks. But point, point well taken. I'm sorry, Chris, did you have something to say? Uh, no, sorry, just a point well taken. All right, excellent. Uh, thanks, Councilor McCaddy. We have uh, Councilor Jackson, Morelli, and then Farr. Jackson. You're up next. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Chris, excellent uh, presentation, and I would humbly suggest this Waterfront Shoreline Initiatives and Priorities presentation, Chris, that maybe just a little glossy it up and make it available in libraries, at community centers, at public meetings. This is uh, demonstrating uh, on paper what people have seen the visual of, and for those who possibly have still not from our community and visitors seen the tremendous transformation of, I'm going to say since about the mid-80s, before my time on council, when the council of the day in the 80s said it's important to purchase uh, the former wax properties, which has become Bayfront Park, 
uh, all the great work, even let's not forget about all along the uh, Beach Boulevard area, Mr. Deputy Mayor, from Confed Park over to the Lift Canal Bridge. Uh, I've said it repeatedly, the economic spin-offs, the water shore, the waterfront development, bringing people to the water's edge. This is a wonderful presentation uh, today, Chris. And I've always seen Mr. Deputy Mayor Chris Phillips um, as being, if you will, the quarterback that I go to, because I know that he has many people that, as he said, on the corporate team that he consults with, meets with uh, the corporate team from the various departments, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that provide the resource, the expertise. But I've always seen Chris, and he's mentioned his steering committee with uh, Lauren Stasiak and Al Dor, as uh, functioning incredibly well, effectively well. And <laughs> look, at, look at the successes of our harbor front and how it's transforming the image of our city and community. And I've mentioned before, executive townhomes on Beach Boulevard going for four and five hundred thousand dollars today, uh, 20, 25 years ago, and nobody would have bet that that could have ever happened in Hamilton. So, Chris, you had me right up until your last slide 20, um, where you say about wanting the two-year approval, the quarter of a million dollars over the two years. I, I like Councillor Collins. I think things are working effectively well. Um, I, General Manager Jerry Davis a couple of years ago uh, assigned Al Dor, and I, I, I don't think Al gets enough credit. I need to say that. I know there's, there's a lot of great staff that are here and primarily from Public Works that have been part and parcel of uh, the development and from the planning department as well going on. But a couple of years ago, I, General Manager Davis assigned Al on special assignments. One of his portfolios was the waterfront, Chris, to work on leases, negotiations, bring it, of course, all back to council. And in our partnerships with the Port Authority, the Waterfront Trust, our Public Works Department, Planning Department. Mr. Deputy Mayor, we've got such a great thing going with great momentum and enhancing the quality of life. And plus, Chris Phillips had brought forward six months ago, Mr. Deputy Mayor, um, Mr. Mayor, that um, to collapse the concept of the Waterfront Development Corporation, which this council unanimously supported, he did reference the possibility of an office. I see that almost as a lighter version, if you will, of the development corporation that we collapsed. But Mr. Deputy, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, as far as I'm concerned, the momentum is there. Uh, Chris Phillips, from uh, both from the planning department and working in conjunction with the city manager's office as well, and all other staff, the corporate team's doing a, a great job. I would just support Councillor Collins' motion receiving 7.3 at the appropriate time and having more updates through the budget process. And Councillor McCaddy's bang on, and him and Councillor Farr. We've had such buy-in from revitalized neighborhoods down in the North End who have seen the good. They're seeing more people interested. We need to keep them on site as well in terms of all the developments through OMB and that and setting sail that have happened. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Morelli and then Farr. Councillor Morelli. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my comments were brief. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Chris, for your presentation today. And it's, just, it's obviously a good one. I've always believed that the between the airport and the waterfront, there are two major uh, economic engines and certainly uh, I, I think that they're a very key part of, of where we're going uh, moving forward. Nevertheless, though, I'm, I'm looking at this, uh, this study and I'm trying to find out where there's any work along the East Harbor front. Uh, and not, I'm not talking uh, uh, the Hutches Confederation, but it's been a long time um, strong feeling of mine that, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we have such a wonderful west entrance to this city. Um, which a lot of people see through the 403, and I'm sure that it, it tracks a number of people uh, into this community. And I also know that coming over the east side of the community, we have millions of people crossing that bridge each and every day. And uh, I know I've had discussions with the Port Authority when we even appointed uh, uh, the city rep, uh, where, you know, you, you travel all the way in along the major corridor, um, and, and you see all these wonderful green buildings, and you see the Burlington even Burlington, Oakville, uh, all these uh, major, wonderful-looking pieces of property. And obviously, when you look to the right, you see these oil tankers, you see uh, recreational vehicles parked, uh, you know, uh, bituminous uh, plants. And, and, and certainly, the, the objective has been, you know, that's our East welcoming, uh, Matt. It has nothing to do, by the way, with, with industry. I think these steel plants are, are something that I can tell you is back as far as 1972. 
we at the FASCO uh, made it very clear that we were going to buffer with, with landscaping and, 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 and do things like that to make that side of the, 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 the entrances look fairly attractive as best you could. In fact, I think they're, it's important that they're there because it's one of the few things that we have that very few can duplicate, and uh, we haven't fully exploited that either. But what if, is there something in here which dedicates uh, some effort to that that eastern harbor front uh, as these millions of people go by? I mean, we, Confederation Park is a stretch sometimes to see it from the south side. Uh, when you're coming even uh, eastbound along the QE heading towards Toronto, you don't always see everything. It's, it's your, you're up and, and away from. So is there anything in this document that dedicates what I think we, we, we need to do? I've always said we need to do with respect to that east harbor front, uh, and I'm not talking again uh, the beach strip. Uh, you know, reference this morning has already been made to the fact that uh, you know, we're doing some terrific work in the in the West End, and I've always very felt strongly about that, as I said earlier. And now with the GO train coming in, we have all these opportunities to bring people into this community, to, to showcase our community. If they come in the West End, it's obvious. Uh, East End, we're still ignoring it from what I see. I don't see anything in this document, and if it's here, it's somewhat buried. So my question to you, Mr. Chairman, to Chris is, where, where, where is that in this document? Is it in here somewhere? And uh, to what extent are you uh, are you in, in any form of, of, of plans to negotiate with the Port Authority, who at the time told us at the time of appointment that they were anxious and they recognized that they weren't making the contribution to our, our the, the cosmetics of our entrance on that side of the Port Authority? I did the original studies with the federal government years ago, and that property was considered to be what we call prestige industries. That's what it was defined to be. If you look at the original plans and the Federal Port Authority, when I, when I did all the harbor front studies for the federal cabinets, uh, and I can tell you that that's, it's a far cry from that. And, and so my question very seriously is, is, is it in this document? And number two, if it is, where is it? And number two, to what extent are we, are we paying attention to that, 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 that item as part of the, what I consider to be the full picture? Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, the, the reality is it's not actually in this document, so you, you haven't specifically missed it um, in it. But I will say that there's elements of it that are on the plan that I, I just did not include in today's uh, presentation. The one aspect is our planning department's go undergoing a review right now of a secondary plan for the Burlington Street um, area as it relates to the East Shoreline. Um, I believe we're calling it the Bayfront industrial secondary plan. I'm kind of looking to Mr. McCabe maybe for, so that there is work being done to look at how that area can be developed, redeveloped um, using uh, different kind of techniques. And certainly I, I remember your comments from last time, I think Councillor Collins as well, over this idea of, um, of are there opportunities to create potentially a uh, business park in the area. So there's, that work is ongoing but wasn't highlighted here. I do think that as we start to get into the Confederation Park master plan process, some of the elements will actually be able to kind of, uh, we'll, we'll look at a broader area similar to this map where instead of if we're, instead of just looking at the, uh, at the area itself relating to a Confederation Park, that we start to look at some of the areas surrounding it. So we could certainly do that. And I could take direction to come back with a little bit more information on that uh, when I update Council the next time around. Mr. Chairman, my, my comments would be, I think we're making, you know, I, I think we're doing everything right in the West Harbor. I want to salute the work of the Waterfront Trust, what's been done to date. I am pleased, I've always said it's the one topic around here that I've never received a negative comment from from public. In fact, as recently as last night when we were here talking about two-way streets where we recognize that not everyone is on the same page, uh, you know, uh, the discussion even led to a bit of discussion about the waterfront, and I can tell you it's always very positive. I think, though, that we're making the biggest mistake we've ever made when we, we ignore the East Harbor front and what people see coming over that bridge. I'm telling you that we are getting more and more attractive every day, and to have a plan. I mean, I think the Confederation Park, Barangas, uh, waterfront is, is, is moving in the right direction, is, is obviously been seeded to move in the right direction. You see all the housing development, even around the beach strip with all those 
those they seem to somehow get around uh, the concept of, of dealing with the uh, the power towers and people have accepted living near those things um, but but you still come over that bridge and you see the wonderful communities of, 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 of aesthetically of the Burlingtons of the world and what's going on in their harbor front and you 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 know it, I'm talking about people by the way that are coming out of Toronto uh, trying to find maybe a, a midway point between here and, 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 and Niagara and Buffalo and, and, and Eastern Seaboard, and this is what they see. And I think we, we why, by leaving it to a secondary position, you know, we are missing the boat. And I'm hoping that if we do continue to miss the boat, it's certainly not what I want to see happen. I'm pretty sure that the next generation will rectify it. But I don't think we should wait that long. And I, I want to I want to make that point very clear that. Uh, you know, the, the, the writing of the book is a wonderful piece, and, and I want to salute that strongly. But I'm going to tell you, they spent a lot of they spent a lot of money in covers in, in, in that East Harbor front. If as long as we continue to ignore working with the Port Authority to make it look like it's a place to be, I think we're making a big mistake. And I hope that in the future you'll reconsider uh, injecting that, and this council will see fit to uh, support it. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Councillor Morelli. Uh, Councillor Farr. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I, uh, you know, from what I'm hearing uh, with respect to the consultation piece, uh, certainly as Ward 2 Councillor, there's been a lot of uh, positivity, lots of great talks, some interesting presentations even uh, from the planning committee level uh, with respect to uh, West Harbor and, and uh, these initiatives. And many people, many residents are just uh, champing at the bit to, uh, to get involved in the process. And... Uh, I've been privy to many discussions and community meetings with people like Michelle Sergi and uh, others and, you know, the evening hours with the neighborhood associations like uh, Central Neighborhood Association, uh, the North End Neighbors, and, um, you know, it's, it's undoubtable that uh, there's a lot of folks that are ready to get involved, particularly where West Harbor is involved. So not necessarily a question for Chris, but uh, for Michelle Sergi, who's the community planner who I work with on this uh, file, or at least get updates from. Um, I thought maybe it would be helpful to my colleagues at this time, given the nature of the subject, that she sort of give us an idea, in short, um, on where we're at with this urban design study as it relates to Barton and Tiffany. Through you. To Michelle. Uh, Michelle. Um, through the chair. Um, the Barton Tiffany Urban Design Study um, is sort of in the initial stages. We're uh, finalizing the terms of reference and, and reviewing all of the background documentation related to the area. Um, the study is intended to consider or focus on the mixed use or commercial and residential uh, land uses that were endorsed by council and ultimately approved by the Ontario Municipal Board. Um, the study is going to be looking at um, elements such as height, densities, um, building forms and locations, road layouts, views and vistas, open space linkages and trails, and connections to and from the area. Um, in addition, in the setting sale document, um, this study requires uh, a full public consultation component, and so that will also be included in the study. Councilor Farr. And I just want, you know, for the record, that Michelle has mentioned this in commu at community meetings, and I think it's important that uh, people understand that there's been a lot of work by staff, Chris, and and uh, many other talented people on this file with respect to um, answering those questions, be it from uh, the media. I know Matthew Van Doggen just last week had a question, very general, but can I get an update on West Harbor? Michelle's always ready with the uh, information, and, and uh, we're, we're particularly looking forward to many of us in Ward 2 uh, ramping it up. Uh, I should also mention that the Downtown West Harbor Committee is monthly, on a monthly basis, updated by Chris on this file. So what I'll endeavor to do is share with you whatever comes my way as the uh, ward councillor and um, that given obviously that this is a, a, a significant council priority. So I'm glad I heard this conversation today and I appreciate the answers from uh, Michelle. Chris, to you, just one question, one more question, Mr. Chair. You mentioned Jamesville and you mentioned uh, the North End neighbors and you even highlighted them in your presentation. But I just um, wonder if you've contemplated or talked to, or you uh, can I can I be assured that you're well aware, though it didn't appear in your presentation today, that we do have Strathcona directly affected as it relates to Barton and Tiffany, and we do have the fairly newly established central re-established Central Neighborhood Association, significant community group, um, very well in touch with um, 
um, uh, what we settled with with respect to the OMB, uh, urban design studies and the like as we move forward, and um, a regular uh, topic of conversation for that group, uh, chaired by Matt Jelly and generally attended by 30, 40 residents. Great resource for you for in, in future communication. So I might just not necessarily ask the question, but make the suggestion that you include Strathcona and the Central Neighborhood Association as they're directly uh, associated with uh, Bart and Tiffany going forward. Otherwise, great presentation and great information. Thank you, Thank you Council Farr. Thanks, Chris. Chris, any intent? Okay. Oh, no, I'm good. Thank you, Council Farr. Now we have no further speakers. We have a motion by Council Collins to receive, seconded by Council Morelli. All in favor? Thank you. Carried. Thank you, sir. Uh, moving on, we do have uh, Hazel Milsom to uh, provide a presentation on item 7.4. And it's uh, the expansion of the community improvement initiatives to community downtowns and piers 5, 6, 7, and 8, and expansion of the downtown Hamilton community improvement project area. Okay, everyone take a deep breath. Welcome. The floor is yours. We do have a motion by Councillor Clark at the appropriate yeah, time. I, I'd be pleased to move it. Um, I sat with the staff. They came out to visit the BIA. It's an excellent plan. I thank everyone for expanding the program and showing that Hamilton are you moving to waive the presentation is that what you do? i'm moving the overall motion <laughs> well wait, at the appropriate time i'll accept that this is not the appropriate time welcome <laughs> welcome all you have the floor and the presentations before before us all right uh, mr deputy mayor councillors first of all my compliments to whoever arranges the agenda for today's meeting what a great progression from chris murray's overall strategy plan to what you just heard from chris phillips and what you heard what you're going to hear from us very nice linkage on all three of them they all have overlap so great timing on that and you're going to hear today from the uh, people who actually did the work on this report uh, not me i'm just going to provide a brief introduction to what you're hearing I think that's fair, right? So uh, basically this report is a report back to you on several issues that you had asked us at previous meetings of this committee to look into. First of all, when we presented to you the expanded boundary for the downtown Hamilton uh, CIP, you asked us to look at expanding it to the uh, community downtowns. We've done that. We have some recommendations for you and recommendations about right-sizing all those programs to the downtowns. We also ha were requested to look at extending the incentives to peers 5, 6, 7, and 8. We have a recommendation for you on that and finally you asked us to look at two small areas that appeared to have been left out of the original uh, delineation of the boundary of the CIP downtown and we'll report back to you on that so uh, for the benefit I know that all of you around this table are well familiar with our two speakers uh, today uh, but for those of you that are, are watching from home and around the world uh, let me introduce uh, First of all, Alan Waterfield, he's the senior planner in our group and will take you through the planning process and the implications to policy. Hazel Milsom is our financial incentives coordinator and Hazel will tell you about the uh, actual changes proposed to the programs. Okay? Exactly. Carry on, Alan. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. <laughs> Through, through uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor to the committee, good afternoon everyone. Um, just to begin with a bit of context, um, this map here illustrates the various areas throughout the city where we have our community improvement programs that are offered by the Urban Renewal Division. Um, you can see uh, it includes in red downtown Hamilton at the center, as well as the five community downtowns in Ancaster, Dundas, Stony Creek, Waterdown, and Bimbrook. Within those community downtowns, and downtown Hamilton, there are eight business improvement areas. There are also five other business improvement areas throughout the city, and those are shown in blue on the map. And the green areas are the, um, the commercial corridors where we offer the commercial housing loan and grant program. So when council last approved some amendments to our community improvement plan and the project areas as well as the programs, as uh, Glenn said, we were given some direction to collaborate with the BIAs and the former community downtowns as well as the Glenbrook Chamber of Commerce, since there is no BIA in Binbrook, to look at the possibility of providing some more community improvement initiatives within the community downtowns. So the recommendations before you today are a result of our review of the programs in the community downtowns. 
as well as our, our discussions with the BIAs. We've met with all of the affected BIAs on several occasions, as well as the Glenbrook Chamber. So Hazel will now um, outline the proposed changes to the programs for you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, the programs that were recommended be expanded to the community downtowns were created to um, create an environment that would encourage private development as well as assist in achieving the density targets identified in the urban Hamilton official plan. The programs on this slide are presently um, offered within the Downtown Hamilton Community Improvement Project area. The first one is the Hamilton Downtown Property Improvement Grant Program. It's a program that provides a grant um, equivalent to the increase in the municipal portion of the taxes attributable to the redevelopment of property. It, the program is self-funded. The city collects the taxes, the increase, and then gives a grant back. It's 100 percent of the municipal increase the first year, declines by 20 percent by each year for the next five, four years. Um, the Hamilton Downtown Office Tenancy Assistance Program is a program that offers low interest loans for tenant improvements. The uh, Basically, the cost to, to um, offer that program is the interest cost. We sufficiently, or we have sufficient money within our uh, capital program right now, so we don't need to increase uh, or ask for any more money to offer that program to the community downtowns. The Hamilton Downtown Commercial Facade Program is a program that offers uh, up to $10,000 for facade improvements. Right now it's offered in the Downtown Hamilton Community Improvement Project area for commercial properties outside of the business improvement areas. As you know, BIAs can apply for the Commercial Property Improvement Grant Program um, up to $25,000 for facade improvements. So we're recommending that we do um, expand this program to the community downtowns for areas outside of the community downtown BIAs. And I'd like to add that we're not just um, transplanting these programs. We are looking at the uniqueness of the community downtowns and adjusting, modifying the terms. So, for example, the uh, facade program, we modify the terms to allow um, eligible items to include th things such as um, fencing, irrigation systems, hard surface landscaping. The cost to fund that program we anticipate in 2013 is approximately $250,000. And uh, that will be referred to the capital, 2013 capital budget process. Hamilton Heritage Property Grant Program, that actually is offered to uh, downtown, the lower city, as well as uh, business improvement areas. We're proposing again to expand that program to the community downtowns. That program offers 25% uh, of the uh, conservation and preservation costs of uh, heritage features of designated properties, as well as any structural or stability work. The maximum grant is $150,000. You can also get a $20,000 a, for a heritage assessment. Um, the cost, again, to expand that to the community downtowns in 2013 is approximately $200,000. And again, that will be referred to the 2013 capital budget process, and we've actually identified that within the downtown block funding. When we actually met with the uh, community downtowns, BIAs, as well as the Glanbrook Chamber of Commerce, we didn't just focus on what type of programs could we expand. We also discussed well, what, are, what other initiatives can the Urban Renewal Division do that will uh, help stimulate private investment. Some of those, and I'll go through some of those, but the uh, first one was right now the Commercial Corridor Housing Loan and Grant Program is a program that we offer to all our community improvement uh, project areas. It offers a 0% interest loan for residential development or redevelopment. Right now the maximum loan is uh, $10,000 per unit to a maximum of 20 units or $200,000 per property. It also offers a $5,000 grant for professional fees paid, so lawyers, etc. To, to offer more of an incentive, and in the absence of the multi-residential program, we are recommending that we increase the limit, maximum limit to $15,000 per unit to a maximum of $600,000 per property or 40 units, keeping the $5,000 grant the same. Um, that uh, will actually allow us to spur or provide an incentive for residential development and um, there are areas or sites within the community downtowns that do allow 40 units um, in accordance with the applicable zone and bylaw. 
Commercial Property Improvement Grant Program, one of the visions we're suggesting. Um, at the beginning of this year, Hamilton Police Services approached our staff and asked us to consider allowing surveillance cameras to be an eligible item under the Commercial Property Improvement Grant Program. We took that out to the community downtowns and the Glanbrook Chamber of Commerce and heard a, a unanimous yes, please expand, um, allow that to be an eligible item. So we will make, we are requesting that we make that, uh, that amendment. Uh, Heritage Property Grant Program, I went over the, uh, the terms and conditions with you earlier, but basically what we heard is the CHIRP program that used to be offered throughout the uh, City of Hamilton offered up to a $50,000 to a $20,000 maximum. CPIG uh, also offers up to $50,000 to a maximum of $20,000. So can we increase the Heritage Program for smaller projects so anything under $40,000 $40, or under would get 50%. Continue meeting with the representatives. Anna and I will continue meeting with the, uh, BI, the community downtown BIAs as well as the Grand Brook Chamber of Commerce every six months to discuss the progress of these initiatives and discuss if there are any other barriers and whether or not we can uh, introduce any other um, incentives or programs, initiatives that would encourage development within those areas. Oh, also, it does include Sylvia Renshaw. Sylvia actually is the, the business consultant within Urban Renewal who specializes in retainment and recruitment of uh, commercial uses. And Sylvia will continue working with representatives of those areas uh, to discuss um, vacancy infill. Comprehensive review of the development charges. Uh, Development charges or the relief of development charges is not a program or initiative that is offered through a community improvement plan. Um, however, it do does offer an effective incentive. The uh, exemption of the development charges or the 90% exemption of the development charges in the downtown is through the city's uh, development charges bylaw or th through the authority of the Development Charges Act. Corporate services staff have been directed to undertake a comprehensive review of the development charges and their impact on intensification and redevelopment. So that the community downtowns will be considered as part of that process. We've been, we've been uh, advised by corporate services department, uh, should I say staff, that the review will start in 2013 and will complete in 2014. Uh, we heard loud and clear that regardless of the uh, promotional activities that our departments do, and people are still unaware of our program. So what we're, what we're um, including in our work plan in 2013 is we'll actually create individual brochures of the, that identify the actual community improvement project boundaries and all the programs that are included or offered within those areas. Uh, we will also have testimonials from people that have taken, some, taken advantage of the existing programs. We're hiring actually a co-op marketing student that will be out, of the, out on site working with uh, the individual property owners and promoting the programs in all the community downtowns. For a pilot, I will uh, meet, I, I think, every half, half a day, every two weeks at a community centre for the purpose of discussing and promoting the programs with prospective tenants. And lastly, uh, we're going to educate some of the uh, customer service staff. We actually have spoken to Marty Hazel as well as uh, Ed Vanderwint with respect to uh, working with their staff to educate them about our program. So when they're giving out building permits and they're also uh, giving out business licenses, they do make people aware that uh, there are these programs. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Alan. He's going to th go through the rest of the presentation. Thank you. <coughs> Alan, you yes, so Just with respect to the uh, community improvement project area boundaries, we were also directed to investigate the feasibility of adding areas on the east side of Victoria Avenue North to the downtown Hamilton Community Improvement Project area. So those areas include the east side of Victoria Avenue between Barton and Bird Street, which is just south of the, um, the CN Railway, and part of the uh, former Royal Oak Dairy Lands on East Avenue. So we have looked at those properties and we've come to the conclusion that we can recommend that they be added to the community improvement project area for downtown. They have some unique characteristics as well as a location that's a fit with the area to which the boundary was expanded to last year. And when the boundary was expanded last year, it um, to the north and east primarily um, had its eastern boundary along the alleyway between Victoria and East Avenue. So this uh, expansion here would extend that boundary further to the north to the railway lines to include those properties that are highlighted here in blue on the east side of Victoria Avenue between Barton and Burge. This area is designated mixed use medium density in the Urban Hamilton official plan and 
on, on that basis, it's unique. It's the only piece of land with that designation that isn't already included within one of the community improvement project areas within proximity to downtown. And, and in fact, we had intended to include it last with our last amendment, but it, it got left out when we removed the hospital lands as they are tax exempt. So this, this would be putting it, it back in. Um, the properties there do um, include opportunities for development. There's um, both public and private parking lots. And, and again, it's in the area to the north and the east where um, the community improvement project areas was expanded that uh, would focus on the more challenged areas to the north and east from the center and where we wanted to provide an incentive for people to invest in those vacant properties and um, buildings that are located in that area. And the other property is the balance of the former Royal Oak Dairy. Um, part of this property, well, it's two separate properties, but part of it is already within the boundary. That's the area shown in pink on, on the slide. And then the, um, the portion of the former Royal Oak Dairy lands to the east is, um, is not in the boundary. So they're split by the, by the alleyway there, which is what, what causes the unique situation in this case. Normally a property that's abutting another property within a community improvement project area, we would include as part of a comprehensive development if it was abutting a property and, and they were to merge or be developed together. Um, in this case, because there's the public alleyway separating the two, they, they can't necessarily merge. So the expansion in this case would be bringing in both sides of, of the former Royal Oak Dairy lands into the community improvement project area without, um, without requiring that alleyway to close. So that um, will provide some, just some additional flexibility for the future in terms of how the development there will play out. Um, and again, the, the, the properties contain both vacant areas as well as vacant buildings that are awaiting a transition to a more appropriate use. Um, the site is zoned for multiple residential development. And with respect to the piers five, six, seven, and eight, um, again, we were directed to investigate adding this area to to the to a community improvement project area. And our, our recommendation is that um, we just defer making a decision on that at this point. Um, we all heard the presentation this morning from Chris Phillips about the various studies that are ongoing in that area, including the um, the valuation and real estate studies. And um, we're looking forward to the results of those studies because we feel that they'll be helpful in establishing what the need, if any, will be for community improvement initiatives down on the piers. And the other area that we plan to be looking at is out in Mount Hope. Um, when we were meeting with the Glenbrook Chamber of Commerce, um, the discussion <coughs> got to um, talking about the Mount Hope area out near the airport and whether or not there could be any community improvement initiatives in that area as well. Um, so the area certainly has seen better days if you've been out there. Um, it does have you know, some buildings that are in need of rehabilitation or, or tenants and um, well it's not necessarily a community downtown and um, it's not a designated node within the official plan. It is an important area within the city given its proximity to the airport and the fact that anyone, most people traveling to or from Upper James from the airport would be traveling through this area. And in fact, further, there's some um, already policy in place within both the Urban Hamilton official plan and the Township of Glanbrook official plan that uh, the city should investigate the possible designation of a community improvement project area within Mount Hope. So um, basically we'd just be um, kicking off that process through uh, your endorsement of, of moving forward in that way today. Um, we would include the, the study as part of our, two, 20, our 2013 work plan. And uh, the study area as per uh, the direction outlined in the official plan would include the um, the areas that are designated commercially in the um, in the official plan, both the, it's 
termed as district commercial in the urban Hamilton and general commercial in the in the township of Glamber OP. Again, that would be the study area. It wouldn't necessarily in the end be the um, the community improvement project area. So in terms of next steps, um, moving forward, we would prepare the amendments to the community improvement project area bylaw, as well as the community improvement plan to incorporate the um, changes that Hazel went over today. Um, and that includes um, amendments to the various program descriptions and terms, which are appendices to the plan. Um, those amendments would have to come to planning committee for a, a meeting before the planning committee as per the planning act and and we'll be doing that with the um, through the legislative process with with public notice and, and again we'll be um, reviewing the um, servicing studies and market valuation studies related to peers five through eight um, that uh, as Chris Phillips indicated earlier are slated to be complete by the end of uh, spring in 2013 to um, continue uh, looking at the feasibility of whether or not incentives are needed at those piers and, and if so, what form they would take. And again, we will uh, establish a, the work plan for the uh, Mount Hope Airport Gateway Study. So that concludes our presentation, unless Hazel or Glenn has anything they'd like to add. Thank you. Uh, we do have uh, a list of speakers. We have Councillor Morelli. Clark, but he's not in the room, so Partridge, Johnson, Duvall, Farr, Jackson, and Brutina. So, and Collins at the end. Councillor Morelli. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor. I, uh, first of all, Alan, uh, Hazel, Glenn, your leadership, uh, I just want to uh, um, salute the work today, plus the, the things you're doing currently in the, in the neighborhood, and, and certainly the Appreciate your uh, bringing uh, about the, the Royal Oak property, which I think makes perfect sense. And my my other question now uh, through you, uh, you know, Barton Street is a, a major uh, project area for this community at large. Uh, it happens to come within my ward, most of it, uh, but ward two, three, and, and actually four. And uh, we're doing studies down there, uh, and we'll continue to do studies. I know that um, uh, I'm planning the charrette with uh, respect to Barton Street and uh, bringing together all the the, the, uh, the services that we can to, to look at Barton Street in terms of what uh, things we can do to, whether it be through a planning process, uh, type of development process that would be allowed. Uh, and my question though is, is I, I want to make sure that I'm, 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 on behalf of Council, that we're taking advantage of every available resource to get Barton Street straightened out and uh, and I think we're moving in the right direction we, we've started the process uh, and we're looking right from James Street right as far as Kenilworth uh, in that area the, the the center is sort of now serves as a as a, a peg we've got the hospital we've got James Street and we've got the harbor all this needs to be hooked together so through mr. deputy mayor I, I'm, I'm trying to uh, get an answer if I could with respect to can we do more uh, within the short term to exploit every available resource given the CIP even along the Barton Street corridor. Uh, I know you've come today with the amendments that we discussed but there is uh, much more to occur with Barton Street that I think is so positive and it's so evident in this community that if we, 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 we pull it together and we've got sort of the the, the best time in the world to do it with the GO train coming next year and, and, and we've got uh, housing being developed down there where, uh, you know, there's a lot of infill going on. Um, we're going to see, you know, the Pan Am stadium sector is going to be developed. We still have some huge blocks, which I think this study is going to address where if you look at that block between, this is an example between Barnsdale and Lotteridge on the north side, it absolutely looks like a, a, a gutted, sheltered area that needs to be fixed. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm, I'm, I'm wanna, I would like to ask Glenn maybe if, there, if we can do more in the short term, do you have any suggestions so that Council could hear them now? Because I think uh, we're, we're, I need to make Council aware that we're on the right track. Uh, and we're, we're moving in a very positive direction. We're seeing growth. Um, 
very slow, but we have one major hurdle to get over, and that's the dealing with these storefronts and 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 just planning very uh, planning uh, abilities that we we have to rectify the situation. Is that correct, that's for you? Uh, to uh, Glenn, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, to the Council. Uh, we hear you and 100% uh, agree with you and support you that Barton Street's uh, time is here. It needs the attention. It's, it's worthy of the attention. Just to sort of recap what we did this year to move it forward, as you're probably aware, we just installed the, the Barton Street gates, uh, Barton Village gates, which are uh, yep. being well received. We also funded an additional uh, study for the BIA to hire a strategic um, consultant. So that strategic, strategic plan is underway now with the BIA. In next year's capital budget for 2013 that you were debating, you know, coming up shortly, we have $100,000 in for a land use study which will really help address exactly the issue you're talking about is for that whole length, and we're actually thinking, James, to, to, to gauge your Ottawa, the full, the full length, what's the most appropriate use economically? What's sustainable? What does the community want? How do you build nodes and communities? Does it, should it remain as an entire commercial uh, designated street as it is now? Or should some of that change to, um, to residential? Uh, multi-dense, high-density residential. And as part of that, what incentives will be needed to, ch to change or are new ones required to deal with the special issues that Barton Street has? That's part of that study coming up in 2013. So I think we're, we're, we're there. Uh, we're there with you in terms of, you know, the next step. And uh, I believe in terms of our report today, we, we do have an amendment, I believe, that's going to be proposed that would see this uh, recommendation for the community downtowns actually moved out to uh, all of the BIAs. So that immediately takes what we've talked about here today and puts it into all the BIAs. So, so through you, Mr. Mr. Deputy Mayor, should is this the appropriate time to to ask that we consider, you know, eventually, if not immediately, stretching the CIP out along the Barton Street corridor, or is that is that not going to help us at this particular time? But should be in the next round of of, of review and assessment. We would certainly take, if that's uh, what you wish, we would certainly take that under advisement, take it away and do that study. I mean, there's a process that we go through, of, obviously, that involves the public, and I think it's a very worthwhile project to do. So I don't see any reason why we wouldn't accept that as your uh, direction today, unless my planner tells me otherwise. Can, can, can I move that at the to yeah, point out that the, um, the whole of the Barton Street corridor already is within our community improvement project area bylaw. The limits of the Barton Street BIA are within the Barton Street Community Improvement Project Area Bylaw. So within that, we offer programs such as the Commercial Property Improvement Grant and the um, Commercial Corridor Housing Loan and Grant Program. And then the balance of Barton Street extending further, um, further east from Sherman, where the Barton Village BIA ends, out to, I believe it is, as far as, or maybe even further than Parkdale, is um, is designated as part of the corridors community improvement project area. So again, that's where we have the um, commercial corridor housing loan and grant program. So I think perhaps the question is whether or not we would provide for more incentives than those that we currently have, or amendments to what we currently yep. have in in that strip. Mr. Deputy Mayor, that's my point. I think that as we move out along that corridor, as far as you just mentioned. Uh, are we doing the most we can do? Can we do more? And can I make that motion today to okay. to get that get that covered off so that 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 that's available? I want to maximize uh, what we're doing along that corridor. And okay, I think so could you I guess uh, report back with respect to options in order to maximize uh, those particular areas? We do have an amendment that Councilor Duval is going to be bringing forward. So perhaps before we go on to further speakers, perhaps we can combine the two amendments so we're talking in its entirety or talking on the motion. Yeah, I'm more entirety. than happy to work with my colleagues to, to get that done. So if, if that's fine and then we'll, uh, we'll come back. Okay, okay. so Councillor Duval, could you, could, I'm going to go to you for that amendment so you can get some clarity on where you're heading and how we can marry the two, uh, to the two issues. Go ahead, read the amendment. Go ahead, yes. Okay, I was all had comments. But, um, through you, Mr. Chair, the program is great. There's a lot of people that uh, actually take good use of this, but I was disappointed to see um, the uh, downtown uh, BIA. I understand that. It was, it was given out to other BIAs, what we call community downtowns, and I'll say Stony Creek, Ancaster, 
That's, that's correctly. But we also have communities within the communities. And I'm talking about Concession Street. Um, we also have Lock Street and Barton Street that I think should be included in this. And, and a lot of people that are uh, coming in with new investments would jump on the bandwagon, I know, very, very well to, to uh, come into some of these programs. So, Mr. Mayor, or, or Mr. Chair, I would like to have an amendment, and, and I have it forward with all the councillors, of including um, Barton, Concession, Lock Street, Ottawa Street, Westdale Village, uh, business improvement areas, and both AI and IA, uh, double I, uh, to be included in this in this program. And, and it's seconded by Councillor Jackson. On that particular amendment, Councillor Murley, would you like to include include your your version of that as well, or your input? <laughs> well, could I just Barton's included, but did you want to amplify? You want to? Well, here, I just want to make sure it. we're doing the right thing. And, and here's what I need to do: Are the Barton Street BIA covers from Wellington to Sherman? So I have James to Wellington that I'm concerned about, and from uh, Sherman to Strathern, uh, I'm concerned about. So I just want to make sure those parts of that Barton Street corridor are included. So that's that would be my my wish. Now, are the are those areas included, uh, or should they be specified for all programs? For all programs, they don't receive all of the programs right now. The the balance of the corridor to the east of the uh, oh. Sherman, again, it's it's. Designated, but no, in no, that I, area we just offered the one program. I think um, I understand it, and I what I want them to be is eligible for all programs. That's what I'm asking. That's that would be okay. included in my motion. Okay, which which is here. That's the question. I think we would be looking at through the the study of Barton Street that Glenn mentioned. But, but we'll be doing next. Hold year. it. I know what you're going to be looking and studying, and I know what the amendment is here. I would just like to add. And, and I think that's what you're asking for, that all the features be included. And I'm asking that the same thing. They're not studying anything. We are. They're, but I want us to be eligible as well. And I think it's important that we see this as, 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 a, as a citywide issue. I'm, you know, I want to include it in the amendment. So that's, that's the, the spirit of my emotion, that James to Wellington and from Sherman to Strathern be included under Bart. Okay. So, but just just to be clear, okay, Councillor Duvall, could you please read your amendment so that we have uh, clarity on this? And on that amendment, I think we should include Kenilworth as well, uh, Avenue North. Okay. Just north. That subsections A1 and A2 be amended to include B BIAs that are not located within downtown Hamilton or community downtowns, namely Barton, Concession, Lock Street, Ottawa Street. And Westdale Village. And Kenilworth Avenue North. And Kenilworth Avenue North. To read as follows, and that's basically we're just adding them into what the. Now, Councilor Morelli, are you fine with that? Well, so, no. so, so if I can just interrupt, yes, Mr. Yes, Chair, yes. I, I think what Councilor Morelli is asking is with all those corridors that he's talked about, would that be under all of Barton Street? If I may, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you to the Councillor. The commercial corridors are different than the BIAs. BIAs may fall within a commercial corridor, but we have many commercial corridors. If you're now looking to extend this another step, so we came back today answering your recommendation, which was to take it to the commercial the community downtowns. We're doing that. The amendment takes it to the BIAs. What Councillor Morelli would, would like to do is now take it to the commercial corridor on Barton Street. So, uh, you know, I'd have two concerns with that, is that A, we have not uh, chatted with our colleagues in finance about the impact of increasing those areas. That, that's, that's more additional money going out. What about the other commercial corridors? How are they going to feel? And how about our BIAs? Because there, there are... There is a covenant that we have sort of with the BIAs that there's a reason to join. There's a reason to, to be involved, to pay the extra taxes, and some of that is that you do have an extra level of incentives that other areas of the city don't have. So those are the only factors. It doesn't mean that we can't do it, but what I'm suggesting is if we could deal with it as a second step, Councillor, is that we deal with the amendment uh, today and we'd be given direction to go away to look at that. That would be, would be my preference. Uh, and in all due respect, I appreciate that, Glenn, but there's no other area 
I, I mean, all of us know that around here. There's no other area. It's, it's, it's planned out each and every time. And I don't come to this table that often. Uh, there's no other area that needs more help than Parton Street, quite frankly. It's a major corridor in this community. And the residents, the business owners, it's, got, it's not even a... It, it's, it's good for this overall city. This has got nothing to do with the just the politics of it. It's it, it's it's if we can fix Barton Street, and we got a few things going for us right now, with go trains and 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 people you know living differently and finding properties down there that are really inexpensive. We're seeing a pickup by young uh, entrepreneurs who are buying properties down there under you know one hundred and twenty thousand dollars and living there and 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 so I it, we need a concentrated and a a, a plan for those areas and so i hear you loud and clear and i i i, I would think that I, I would if i could get a motion on the table which which puts the barton street corridor which includes the the uh, and, and, and you know i'm not trying to cover everything but the, the kenilworth uh, piece is, a, is another blight on our community we've done terrific with ottawa street i think we're heading in the right direction and it's worth a, a very strong hand right now to, to, to move that motion and to get it on its way if if, if there's a major hurdle through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to Glenn, that, that you run into, then you can always come back here. But we know that, that, that Barton Street is an absolute disaster, and we need to deal with it. And, and so, and I know that Glenn will tell you this, and through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that, you know, we're going to put some area rating money towards charrettes down there. We're, we're trying to do everything we can, and I, I would urge you to to allow us to to make a motion today to extend it to, yep. to accomplish right. that. And, and that's and, been and accepted. That's my motion. That's been accepted uh, with Councillor Duval's motion, and that's seconded by Councillor Jackson. Now, on the motion as amended, we have... Kenworth is on here. We, on the motion, we have moved by Duval, seconded by Jackson. Now, on the um, motion as amended, we have speakers list in Councillor Clark, who's just walked in. <laughs> okay. Partridge, Johnson, Farr, Jackson, Bertina, and Collins. But we're going to do it in its entirety. Uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, through the Chair, before the debate on the amendment starts, I'd like to be able to read it back so that sure. it's clear what, okay, what the amendment is. Okay, go ahead, Madam is. Clerk. Okay, so it is that subsections A1 and 2 be amended to include the BIAs that are not, not located within downtown Hamilton or community downtowns, namely Barton, Concession, Lock Street, Ottawa Street, and Westdale Village, and, and portions of the Barton Street Commercial Corridor, including James Street to Wellington Street and Sherman Avenue to Strathairn Avenue and Kenilworth Avenue North. That's correct. So on now, Councillor Clark, the floor is yours. Yeah, what I was saying earlier, Deputy Mayor, and. Uh, our concern when we started having the, these these efforts to lower Stony Creek was simply making sure that as we're building the new city of Hamilton, which is what we're doing, that all of those areas are included in it in some way. And I'm thrilled that, that the staff and, and my colleagues around the table, that we all recognize that all of those BIAs have an opportunity for tremendous investment if we work together collaboratively. So this is a great outcome. It's actually better than I had anticipated. Um, so I just wanted to thank the staff for all their hard work and yourself, sir, and all of my colleagues for making this happen. I know my community, our community, will be thrilled as I'm sure yours will. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And um, I echo those sentiments as well. I just wanted to personally thank uh, Hazel and Alan for attending the BIA Waterdown BIA meeting in October. It was their second visit and I think the board was thrilled to hear about the program. I think more importantly they were very pleased with how it's going to be rolled out. So uh, my question through you is with respect to the specific brochures and promotional pieces that will be specific to the area, could you just expand a bit on what would be included in, uh, in Waterdown? 
It's on. So the brochure for Waterdown BIA would actually uh, have a map of the community, the waterfront of the Waterdown Community Improvement Project area. So that would identify any properties captured within that boundary would be eligible to apply for the programs. The programs would be listed. Um, it would also have obviously have contact information. What we'd also like to do is actually have testimonials within the brochures from people that have taken advantage of this program um, because we're already offering the Commercial Corridor Housing Owner Grant Program within Waterdown as well as the um, commercial property improvement facade program. So we'd like to actually contact some people that have taken advantage to get testimonials because, to be honest, when we're actually out there with the public, there's still some skepticism with respect to, well, how long does this process take? So hopefully by doing that, uh, it will alleviate some of those concerns. And thank you, Hazel, for raising that because uh, we do have... Um, two or three, if, if not more, examples of just absolutely beautiful buildings that have been restored and where the merchants have, uh, and the owners have taken, been part of the program, invested it into their buildings, and it's just, it's been such a, a fabulous improvement to downtown. But there is that skepticism there on the process and how it's going to roll out and is it difficult, is it complicated. So thank you through you, Chair. I just wanted the viewers watching and for the general public who's in attendance to to hear that it will be specific, not just to water down, but to all the areas that that are in the motion that has been covered off. And uh, I thank you very much for all your work. Thank you, Councillor uh, Partridge. We now have Councillor Johnson, then Farr, Bertina and Collins. So. Councillor Johnson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And uh, through you, I just wanted to congratulate Alan and Hazel and, and Glenn. When this first came up in, in my first part of the term, I was actually accused of being parochial because I was saying, we have abandoned buildings, we have heritage buildings that need it. And given the, the challenges of having so much development put out into the hamlets in my ward, it's very frustrating to try to get commercial to come out and set up businesses within a, a small uh, area. So this is absolutely wonderful. Um, but just for the folks at home, I just want to be clear that, Glenn, you and I had a conversation about Mount Hope yep. over a year ago. We were hoping to get some gateways put in. I had a meeting, a community meeting of 120 people who showed up asking for things in this town. Uh, commercial things, let's beautify the place up, let's clean up our parts, let's take them back from the vandals. And since that meeting, I have to honestly say the vandalism has dropped over 90%. We've got the beautification club going. Um, you and I talked about having some gateways with yep. some aviation themes in it. So when you did go to the Glambert uh, Chamber of Commerce, I just want to be clear that we already had these conversations going, and that's why you were going to the chamber as well. Correct. And it's great that you are going to the, the Glambert Chamber of Commerce, but just a word of caution that, that there's probably maybe two members that are actually from the Bimbrook or the Mount Hope area. The rest are all from Hannon and the Alfrida areas. So you, just to give you some warning that you may hear some, we need some stuff down in our areas too. So having said that, um, I just, I really want to um, point out that I really appreciate the fact that, that you've listened, you've taken our, cons our concerns into hand, um, and this is something that now I can go back to my communities and say, look what we've got to offer for people to come in and, s and give you the amenities so we can keep these communities walkable and don't have to drive 20, 25 minutes to get to what you need. Uh, but also, just to keep on the on the back burner too, Winona is next. So, yeah, I didn't want to put it into that that motion because we're not quite at that point yet. But I do want to yeah. put it on the on the back burner. Winona is next. Yeah, thanks Thank for the warning. Okay, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll, Rob. Did you want to interject? Through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the one thing I just would want to advise is that. Uh, the expansion will have an operating and capital budget impact, so you need to refer those impacts to the 2013 uh, budget process uh, so the guys can come back okay. with an estimate of what the expansion okay. and what the potential okay. impact would be. Okay. So at the appropriate time, we'll include that in the actual motion, Madam Clerk. Um, we now have uh, Councillor Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm glad Rob mentioned what he did. I, I however, am not too concerned on the impact financially because uh, we all have agreed, at least in the course of the last two years, that these incentives are an investment. And uh, there's a great return on that investment. If we want to expand it, I think it's great. I'm very supportive of uh, both uh, Councillor DeBall and Jackson, and now um, Councillor Morelli and yourself um, seeing this expansion uh, 
grow in the last 10 minutes or so. So that's not a concern. I'm going to, uh, having worked very closely in the last few years with Glenn and, and Hazel, and that means a myriad of, of community meetings, many taking place in the evenings. I remember we spent four hours one uh, morning in, on a Sunday or Saturday at the Sheridan Hotel talking to this uh, uh, Toronto investor bullish on Hamilton, this big corporate lawyer, very bullish on Hamilton and making investments. They spend an inordinate, an inordinate amount of time on urban renewal. Uh, and I think the office is six deep through you, Mr. Chair. Glenn, how many do you have on staff there? Yeah, there are actually uh, seven of us in the office, including the executive assistant, yeah. And, and through you, Mr. Chair, those are limited resources, all things considered, and this expansion is pretty significant, albeit important, and I'm sure you feel the same way. Are you going to be able to manage your time well? Through the chair. We, uh, we believe so. Yes, yes, Councillor, thank you. Um, and we do understand that, that Council has given a pretty strong direction to, to all of us here in staff to keep the uh, increase in this uh, year's budget to as low as humanly possible. So my staff are quite keen. They're prepared to do the extra work. We are not, ask, we are not asking for any extra FTE. Good answer. Good answer. That was the answer I expected. So that's all I have. Thank you and congratulations Thank you, to uh, Scott and everyone for bringing this forward. Thank you, Council Farr. We have Mayor Bettina next and then Councilor Collins. Thanks, uh, <clears throat> Deputy Mayor. I'm glad that Councilor Farr mentioned impact because it's always, I, I enjoy the presentations by our staff so much because they're so productive. This group of people is one of the most uh, productive financially groups within the city. And you can't be very productive cleaning snow, kasha, salt, and dry, you know, so. But what we have here, and I just want to put in context, Mr. Deputy Mayor, in 2001, the Spectator did a series of articles called Lament for a Downtown, and one of the chapters was called Rotting in the Core, and it had a list of a whole bunch of buildings downtown that were actually near a state of collapse. And the mayor of the day said it would be 15 to 20 years before we could possibly get this done. And by 2010, all the buildings mentioned in the, in the article were done. And the important thing is, and uh, for Tim and Glenn and Hazel and Alan and everybody in that staff, the net of this office is in the millions. Yes. So I know you'll, we'll get those numbers later on, but it's important in relation to any decisions we make about uh, this office that this office is making us a lot of money. And But not only that, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the city is moving ahead and improving and people visibly see that. So to expand the, the uh, areas of influence and as uh, Councillor Johnson mentioned, you know, there, you know, people will be putting pressure in those areas, their old buildings and all of that stuff. Well, we know that it works because we were like the poster child for rotting old buildings. And the, the classic was 68 King Street East. It was actually in danger of collapse. It had been empty for over 30 years. It's full. And the apartments are totally taken up. And there are two businesses on the ground floor, including a new tackle place. So brilliant work. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. And I heartily endorse the uh, report. And thanks for all that you've done for the city. Thanks. Glenn. Thank you, sir. Hazel. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councilor Collins. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, echo the mayor's uh, comments. Um, you know, for, for as much as we've uh, bragged about our record building permits and the taxes that are coming with it, it's in large part because of the programs that we have in place and, and the hard work that Glenn, you and your staff are doing. And um, you know, from the from the largest buildings here, from that Mr. Vranich is doing to you know the little places like the Green Smoothie Bar on James Street North. I mean, your programs are you have your fingerprints on almost every development, especially in the core, and now by extension to other places in the community. And I, I, I think if there's one area though where we could improve, it's the um, it's advertising the fact that we're actually a part of these projects. Because when I attended the Hivex uh, development, um, the day that they had here at the uh, at the Sheridan. One of the complaints leveled at council is we're not supportive of the downtown. We're catering to greenfield development. We have subsidized development charges, and uh, you know I stood up in front of the group to say that in fact you know there probably isn't a a project that's going on in the core of the city that hasn't taken advantage of one of your programs. Right. And so I, I think we we somehow need to get that message out there. Um, people are looking at these developments saying it's great that the private sectors come to town. 
But I think people be, need to be cognizant of the fact that, in fact, the city has played a role in part um, as part of these developments. And, and maybe there's something we can do to, um, just as you've done with the, um, the books that you've distributed uh, through the GTA in terms of spaces that are available here, you know, and, and just as Mr. Everson does with his own economic development report, uh, and I know you've sent us similar materials, Somehow, though, that message needs to get out there, whether it's with the HiveX group in particular, there are other mm -hmm. groups, NGOs, that um, are meet regularly. Maybe there's something we can do internally to ensure that uh, the public is aware of the fact that you are an in integral part of the development process that happens in the center, center of the city and elsewhere. Thank you, Councillor Collins. Councillor McCaddy. Thanks, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Deputy Mayor. I just want to echo those comments. Uh, and thank Councillor uh, Collins for attending that HiveX. I, I couldn't be there that Saturday, I think it was, and uh, and I, I, I have heard some comments from young folks who were there, and, and they very much appreciated uh, Councillor Collins uh, being there that that day. It meant a lot uh, to them, and of course reflected good back uh, or, or well back uh, to us on Council as well. So thanks to Councillor Collins for that. So great uh, report, uh, and great to see this stuff expanding. I uh, have to admit, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I was wondering about Councillor Morelli's comments about uh, expanding onto, onto Barton Street, but then uh, after thinking about it, uh, that's a, a challenge that we've all identified uh, over the years uh, as we travel down in that part of the city. And of course, Councillor Morelli deals with it every day. Uh, and uh, I think that's going to be money well spent. We'll need to figure out how much money that is and how it affects the city budget. That's just a process that we, we need to go through. But, uh, you know, if we've got a great James Street and a great uh, King and this sort of thing and Barton Street continues to be in its current uh, state, uh, you know, we just haven't really improved Hamilton to any great extent. So I, uh, I, you know, upon reflection, I uh, strongly support uh, Councillor Morelli and his, uh, the amendment that he added and uh, look forward to any discussion at the budget process as to how much that is. I, I think back to the... Uh, the time when uh, the NDP government was in place and there was a bit of a plan for Barton Street at that time which uh, was partially uh, implemented but didn't come to full fruition uh, uh, and I think it's time for us to get back to that in a not just in a small way but in a huge way and I think uh, that's that's something we've done today in addition to addressing the the question that we came here to talk about originally which was the uh, the downtowns uh, the other downtowns throughout uh, the uh, former uh, region of Hamilton Wentworth area thanks Thank you, uh, Councillor McCarty. Having uh, no further speakers indicated, uh, Councillor uh, Duvall, could you just read your motion one more time, seconded by Councillor Jackson, so we can uh, vote for it in its entirety? So that subsections A1, 2, and 3. Writing another one. Um, amended to include the BIAs that are not located within downtown Hamilton or community downtowns, namely Barton, Concession, Lock Street, Ottawa Street, Westdale Village, and portions of the Barton Street Commercial Corridor, including James Street to Wellington Street, and Sherman Avenue to Strathern Avenue, and Kenilworth Avenue North, to read as follows. And, and now that's seconded by Councillor Jackson. And All in favor? Oh, hang on, hang on. Oh, hang on. Oh, Councillor Duvall. That subsection A be further amended by adding the following as subsections A6, uh, six, A6, six, that, that the operating and capital budget impacts of these expansions be referred to uh, the 2013 budget process. Okay, so that's moved by Duvall, seconded by Jackson. All in favor? Carried. Carried. Oh, now moving on, we do have one point of clarity with respect to Councillor Cal. I did, I did, I did. Uh, well, I had to take a police call, so uh, I, I wasn't here for the debate, but I noticed that Upper James isn't mentioned in this uh, um, um, scope either. And uh, uh, there's a lot of development potential on Upper James. There's still lots of areas. There's still have residential homes or, or uh, vacant lots and, and so forth. So I certainly wouldn't want this program not to consider and incorporate uh, Upper James certainly on the west side because that's where there's a lot most of the investment uh, uh, opportunity but I mean obviously Upper James in general uh, is there a way that we can incorporate that or if we address that at a different uh, time frame that's the point okay Terry 
can we can we discuss just uh well, we're in the, we're in a position of formulating a BIA we, we just uh, we just uh, approved that so if we, we need a couple of items to clarify before we go to break we didn't have the opportunity to have a break so uh, well, Ms. Ms. Mr. Chair, I just want to add that we are in I am in the process of uh, working uh, to, to create a BIA on number James uh, by V uh, um, by uh, Fennel. So I just want to make sure that I don't miss the bus on, on the opportunities on the CIP or, or any other programs. At the same time, we're trying to create a, a, a BI in that particular okay. location. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead. Now, Councillor Collins, on your motion, you, there were two items. I, uh, my apologies. The item B was not emphasized at the appropriate time. So I'd like for you to emphasize item B on that. Yeah, that was on the uh, last issue that we had passed on the waterfront shoreline initiatives. Part A was passed where we, we received the report. Part B was that staff be directed to provide a status update to GIC during the first quarter of 13. That direction wasn't mentioned by yourself. That's good. So I, it's seconded, seconded by, by Councillor Jackson. Jackson. All in favor? Carried. Carried. Now on this item that we just dealt with, um, Madam Clerk, we need um, to clarify that it was actually, sorry, can you elaborate on the clarification? Yes, through the chair, the amendment is to subsections one and two of section A of the recommendations. And it was read in what, in what way? It was read inaccurately or was not emphasized? No, I thought that I heard subsections one, two, and three, but it is only one and two. Okay, noted as a clarification. And I did hear tapping. We're going into a break now, so Councillor Farr. This should be brief, but I, I got caught up in uh, the amendment that I didn't get a chance to ask my question on, on item E of this uh, report. And I just have a quick question, and I yeah. apologize for that extending the debate, but uh, I can't understand why, Mr. Chairman, we can't hit the ground running and why we need to defer uh, item E. Why can we not just include item E? Um, and that way uh, we're ready to go with the CIPA once the peers five, six, seven, and eight, uh, and all that work is complete, rather than having to go through the motions uh, after the fact. Can someone help me with that? Ben Hazel, who would like to take that? This, this is item E, that the decision to designate a community improvement project area at Piers 5, 6, 7, and 8 be deferred pending analysis of outcomes of ongoing studies at the waterfront. Well, the, the time frame we're coming forward with the amendments to the CIP for the expansion to the community downtowns and the other amendments that you made today on the floor is uh, January or February in 2013, so we can quickly make those amendments. The um, studies coming back for Piers 5, 6, 7, and 8, they're not back until the end of April. So once they're back in April, then we can review um, the results of those to determine what type of incentives we have to create, and then we do a, a, another amendment. So it's critical that the process it goes in that order. Okay. Fine enough. Thank, Thank you, you very Dr. Much. Far. Motion to recess, moved by uh, Collins, seconded by Jackson. All in favor? Carried. Carried. Uh, half hour?